Welcome to the Prophecy Club, where we study and research Bible prophecy. Our topic tonight is exposing the Illuminati from within. You see, my Bible tells me that we are supposed to expose the, the devices of the devil. We're supposed to fight evil at every corner. Well, how can we fight it when we don't understand it, when we don't know about it? Because many times it is hidden. Uh, after all, the Satan, the, the devil, is the most subtle beast of the field. And our speaker tonight is uniquely qualified to speak on it because he was uh, spent many years in it. As a matter of fact, he was author of seven books. He was a satanic and voodoo high priest, ninth degree oriento templi orientis, ordo templi orientis, second degree church of Satan, new age guru, occultist, chandler. He taught astrology, tarot cards, Astro projection, and he's a ninth degree Rosicrucian and a 90th degree Mason and a member of the Illuminati. Will you help me welcome Bill Schneblin? Well, I'd like to correct one thing. I'm a former member of the Illuminati. Amen? Because I received the light of Jesus Christ, and I'm excited about that. Um, folks, I am here tonight because I am a great believer in the fact that we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. And that's why I want to begin by sharing with you very briefly my testimony of how I came through a great deal of darkness into the light of Jesus Christ, then we're going to try and get into our material. We have, we have a tremendous amount to talk about here tonight and to cover, and uh, I, just, I just ask for your patience and your prayers as we, we try to steam through this. Um, I started out wanting to serve God in the worst possible way, and for the first 30 years of my life, that's exactly what I did. I was raised in a very religious home, uh, but I didn't know Jesus Christ from a doorknob. I, I didn't know much about the Bible. I wanted to get into the ministry, which in my case was through the uh, Roman Catholic Church. That's what I was raised in. And I knew very little about the Bible, and I wanted to be a priest. When I got to college, however, I had my plan somewhat derailed by two forces that were very strong at that time. This was the time of the Vatican Council, Second Vatican Council, when a lot of ferment was taking place in the Catholic Church. A lot of my professors were telling me that the Bible wasn't really true, what little I knew about the Bible was false, that Moses didn't really part the Red Sea, that uh, Adam and Eve never really existed, that Jesus didn't really rise from the dead. What did that leave me? You know, Here I was going to be a priest, and I didn't know what to believe in. The other thing that happened, two convergent forces, is I had some professors that today would have been called New Agers. Back then, the word wasn't even heard of. And they played on a doctrine that's part of Catholic theology. And this doctrine is the idea that the priest is another Christ. And when you go up on the altar and you confect the sacrament of the Eucharist, as it's called, which means you turn the bread and wine literally into the body and blood of Jesus, you are acting literally as another Christ. And they told me, these, these particular professors, if I wanted to do that, if I wanted to be another Christ, I had to do the same things that Jesus did to attain that exalted state. See, they did not believe that Jesus was God Almighty. They believed he was a kind of ascended master and that he had learned how to do all of these things by going and studying under gurus in the Far East and studying under the Magi of Egypt. And some of you may have heard about this, either from bookstores or... TV shows, The Lost Years of Jesus. Now here I was, I was 18, 19 years old. I was being told this stuff by people who had PhDs, THDs, DDs, you know, all that stuff behind their name, you know, Roman collars on. What was I supposed to think? So I believed them. I began studying the occult because I thought this was the way that I would become more Christ-like. See the sinister logic behind this? Amen? And, and when you don't have, see, that's the problem. When you don't have an objective standard of truth to measure anything with, you can, it's like having a rubber ruler, amen? You can take a ruler and if it stretches, you can make an inch this long, you know? And that's what these people were doing. That's why this is called the canon of scripture. Canon in Greek means ruler or measuring stick. This is our measuring stick for truth, but I didn't understand that at that time. So what happened was, 
I fell into this. And by the time I got through most of my college years, I had realized that the most efficient way, the most powerful way to acquire occult knowledge was, in fact, to become a witch. Now, that might seem a pretty broad jump from being a candidate for the ministry to becoming a witch, but that's what I did. And, and so by the time I got out of high school, uh, college, I had written the King of the Witches, Alex Sanders, over in London, and he had directed me to a, a coven that was in Plymouth, Massachusetts. All this was taking place, I should explain, in Iowa, of all places. I mean, what a place to find witches, you know, right in the, the heartland. But let me tell you, you can find witches anywhere nowadays. And so by the time I got out of college, some of you already um, saw this, but this is what I ended up looking like. I was quite a freak. In fact, somebody on the tour this time said I looked like Jerry Garcia, which I don't know if that was a compliment or not. But as you can see, I had a lot more hair in those days. Um, anyway, I went out and I took a leave of absence from my seminary duties. And I, I went and taught high school for a couple of years and met my wife. Uh, she also had a profound interest in witchcraft and the occult, had been studying it for some time. And so we ended up getting together. And um, we found that there was a fellow who was the Grand Master Druid of all North America down in Arkansas. Uh, and he lived out in the country. Uh, you find that amusing, don't you? <laughs> We're going to be talking more about Arkansas before the evening is over, believe me. Anyway, he, um, he lived in a little tiny, well, actually he lived out in the country near a little tiny town called Hattieville, Arkansas. And from there he ran a huge network of druids all over the United States. And he saw some promise, quote unquote, in my wife and I, and offered us to come down and study directly under him to become high priest and high priestess of the Druids. So that's what we did. We went down and um, spent three months in the summertime studying under this man and learning all the mysteries of the five points of the pentagram, all the mysteries of hermetics and mental magic and natural medicine and all sorts of stuff. Um, while we're down there, one thing that bears reporting, because it bears directly on some things we're going to speak about later on this evening, is uh, that we'd sit on a, par on a park bench, or a picnic table rather, under the stars every night, and we would learn about these occult mysteries. And almost every night, over the, over the mountain that we were, we were living on, we'd see a UFO hovering that was quite plain, plain as day and uh, looked like a, like a long cigar-shaped thing with lights around it and was, was as clear to me. It looked about the size of a baseball held at arm's length. And we'd always ask him, what is that? And he would never tell us. Because I already had had an abiding interest in UFOs, which had started when I was uh, even a teenager. I was involved with NICAP, which is the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena. And it's now, I don't think it's functioning anymore, but at that time it was one of the two more reputable flying saucer groups in the country. So anyway, we got ordained as high priest and high priestess, and we were married for time and all eternity by a witch hand fasting in Zion State Park over in Zion, Illinois, which is just north of Chicago, uh, in a magic circle with 200 witches standing around us, a huge circle with all of them dressed in black and a big bonfire in the center. And uh, after that, we went out on our way to spread the gospel of witchcraft. However, a funny thing began to happen. We went from city to city. We, we finally found that the best place to be was in Milwaukee because there we had 90 students in advance lined up who wanted to learn witchcraft. This was in the mid-70s. And so what happened was we settled there and we began to set up regular classes and covens. Before we knew it, though, new things began to come on the horizon. Um, both some of my friends who were witches, in fact, the guy who owned the occult bookstore in town, and also some of my spirit guides, because I was also a trans medium, or what today you would call a channeler. I'd been ordained as a spiritualist minister and trained in that. Um, began to tell us that if we really wanted to understand the deep parts of witchcraft, we need to get involved in Satanism. We need to read the Satanic Bible. And so I bought a copy and looked that over, and it was very, very interesting. I found I agreed with much of it, which would have astonished me just a few years earlier when I'd begun my occult studies. And see, this is how Satan does things. He gradually introduces you to ever more and more bizarre doctrines until all of a sudden you're overwhelmed. Well, I joined the Church of Satan, and soon after that, 
I, uh, I ended up getting the second degree in the Church of Satan, which is called Warlock. This is the certificate, <coughs> excuse me, that you will see. This is also in a couple of my books. It's reproduced. You'll notice down at the bottom here, I even got Anton LaVey's autograph. Isn't that wonderful? Uh, anyway, I want to just point out a couple of things here. Notice that it says, the Church of Satan having, you know, passed before the Council of Nine, order the trapezoid. Now, remember that. That's going to be significant later. Uh, also, I should explain that I had legally changed my name because Christopher Pendergon's sin was much more numerologically powerful than William Snevlin. Plus, it sounded a lot more dramatic, don't you think? I was, I was a Reverend Dr. Sin. Doesn't that, that sound like a character on a TV show or a soap opera or something? Anyway, um, so that was what was happening. Uh, so we began to work in, in Satanism, and I learned that, that Anton LaVey, and this may astonish some of you, but Anton LaVey's brand of Satanism is like kid stuff. It's entry-level Satanism, so to speak, because it's used primarily to draw people into the darker stuff. And it's very evil, don't get me wrong. I mean, it's not like it's a Sunday school picnic or anything, but compared to the real serious Satanism, it's, it's totally, totally harmless, relatively speaking. In order to get into that, though, there was something very important I had to do. I had to become a Freemason because you can't get involved in Satanism on the hardcore level without first being a Freemason. And so I found someone, I was sponsored into the Masons, and I became a first, second, third degree Mason. Uh, I went through the York Rite. I went through the shrine. In fact, this is my, uh, my little shrine portrait here. As you can see, by this time, I'd kind of shed some of my hippie appearance. Uh, I just shudder every time I see that thing. Um, but this is just kind of by way of documentation that I, I really was involved in these things. That was my official shrine portrait, which they took as part of my initiation. Uh, then soon after that, I, I went through the Scottish Rite as well. So I basically covered all the branches of masonry that there are to do. Uh, and then I went even beyond that. But uh, this is my certificate as a, as a uh, sublime prince of the royal secret. That's the title, 32nd degree Mason. See, Masons love big sounding titles. I mean, they just think that's the greatest thing. You know, you, they have titles like perfect master, most perfect master, perfect excellent master. You know, I mean, you know, like these people have a self-esteem problem, right? Anyway. There's a couple things I just want you to notice about this, and I'll come back to it later. You'll notice the all-seeing eye up there, and you'll notice the motto, Ordo Ab Cal. And we'll talk more about those later. Uh, so once I went through all of that, I was worthy, I was ready to become involved in hardcore Satanism. What did that mean? Well, that meant I had to sell my soul to the devil. I didn't know that the devil already had it, amen. This is a little ceremony that the devil likes to do, and I had to sign my name on the contract in blood. I had to sign my name in the black book. The deal was that I got seven years in which the devil would give me anything I wanted. He'd given me wine, women, song, dope, power, you name it. I'd have it. Then at the end of those seven years, he got to kill me and take me to hell. What a deal. Anybody want to sign up? Yeah, you see, you've got to understand something. The satanic doctrine here is that hell is not what we believe it is or what the Bible teaches it is. The satanic doctrine is that hell is this incredible party. It's like a nonstop, all eternity orgy. So you're, you're smoking dope, you're fornicating your brains out, you're listening to rock and roll through all eternity. And it's party hardy time. Whereas we were told that he heaven was a place where losers, that it couldn't stand the dark, violent ecstasies of hell, would just sit up there and strum on a dang harp for all eternity and just be bored, silly. So, bad scene. We thought hell was better. So this was how deceived I became. I went out and I got more and more involved in these various things. Uh, I signed up more people to get to sell their souls to the devil. I'm ashamed to say that now. But uh, continually this was happening. And uh, essentially, the next thing that happened, before I could get onto the priesthood of Satanism, <coughs> excuse me, I had to get seven people to sell our souls to the devil. The other thing I had to do, and this might astonish some of you, is I had to become a Catholic priest. I had to go back to my original vocation. Because you cannot be a satanic priest unless, first of all, you're a Catholic priest. And if that surprises you, I just suggest that you go and you read some of the medieval literature. 
You'll see that that is in fact the case. Okay, so fortunately, <coughs> or maybe unfortunately, I had discovered a bishop of the old Catholic Church in the city of Milwaukee who was more than willing to ordain me as a priest in exchange for me making him a witch priest. It was sort of a quid pro quo thing, kind of like what's going on at the White House these days. Except I never got to sleep in a Lincoln bedroom. But anyhow, what happened was, is uh, I got consecrated a Catholic priest and then Later on, I got involved with a, the, the patriarch of the Gnostic Catholic Church down in Chicago. And this is my certificate being ordained, uh, pardon me, consecrated as a bishop in the, old, in the Gnostic Catholic Church. And uh, you'll notice a couple of other things that might be important here. One is that you'll notice that this is the ancient and primitive rite of Memphis and Misrium. Now, this is in French, and I apologize for that. Uh, the certificate is in my book. Uh, Lucifer dethroned if you want to see it and, and try and translate it. Now the rite of Memphis and Misrium is the rite of masonry that a lot of masons aren't aware even exists. And this rite has 97 degrees. And I was raised to the 90th degree within that. If you'll notice down here, it says I was given the title of Grand Master of the Order of the Temple. That's 90th degree. And at the same time, I was made the Auxiliary Bishop of Milwaukee of the Gnostic Catholic Church. So I was just all set, man. I was loaded for bear. I mean, I had all these powerful initiations, and I understood all these powerful experiences. And this basically took me over what is called the abyss. Now, that's an occult term, and I don't have time to explain entirely what it means, except once you get over the abyss in occult progress in ceremonial magic, you transcend good and evil. You become beyond such mundane considerations as good and evil. You're beyond morality. And you become essentially a god living on the earth, walking. And, and you basically look at human beings as if they were cattle. And so at this point, I made a choice. I was asked to make a choice. Because to move through what is called eighth degree within this particular system, I had to choose to either study lycanthropy or else vampirism. Now lycanthropy is a, a fancy word for werewolves, it's learning how to be a werewolf. Now I knew a couple of werewolves and I learned from them and in fact it's rather a painful process. And I'm not really into pain, you know, so I decided I'd rather inflict pain than receive it. So <laughs> instead I went the route of vampirism. So I was, I was taken down and introduced to a, uh, in a church down in Chicago, which was wholly given over to this vampiric cult. And I, I, I was made to drink the blood of what I now believe to be a fallen angel, and, and he in turn drank my blood. And by doing that, something happened to my blood, and I was actually physiologically transformed in many subtle ways. My blood type changed. I became impossible for me to eat, I couldn't eat anything. I couldn't drink anything except blood. The only solid food I consumed was the Catholic communion host. And I lived like this for over a year. I couldn't go out in the daylight without getting blisters on my hands. I, I, I had to get a third shift job working as a, a, new, excuse me, a newspaper carrier for the Milwaukee Sentinel. Um, I also couldn't get very near garlic. Uh, now, on the other hand, I didn't have the power to turn into a bat or anything like that. I think that's something that maybe Bram Stoker made up. I, I couldn't turn into mist and slide under doors either. Um, so Hollywood kind of embellished some of this. But the point is, I was drinking blood and I was addicted to blood. Understand this, I, by, by day, so to speak, nowadays, my normal job is I'm a therapist. And I work with addicts. 40 hours a week, people that are addicted to drugs, alcohol, and currently gambling. And I, I myself used to be a cocaine addict before Jesus Christ set me free. So understand something. Addiction is powerful, and the essence of addiction is that the more you get of something, the more you want. And, and so I kept needing more and more blood. Now, originally, the way I got around this is... Um, I, would, I had many witches under me. In fact, by this time, we had more than 175 women that I had personally initiated into witchcraft. That doesn't count the men that my wife had brought into the craft, which were probably just about the equal number. 
And of those women, some of the ones that had reached very high levels in the craft were more than willing to have me bite them in the neck. So I had kind of a harem, if you will, of five or six women that wouldn't mind me tapping their jugular vein every two or three days so I could keep my, my thirst slaked, so to speak. And uh, this went okay for a while, but gradually it wasn't enough. I kept needing more and more and more blood. And it just went on and on. And I, I began to live a life that was like the tortures of the damned. I'd drive through the streets at night in my job and, um, you know, putting newspapers in boxes in the wee hours of the morning. And I'd see the occasional prostitute or whatever, and it would be all that I could do to not leap on that woman and rip her throat out and just drink every drop of blood out of her, out of her body. It was, it was not easy. And the only thing that kept me from doing that was the fact that I really loved my wife, and I knew that if I did something like that, it would shatter our lives if I was caught. It would shatter our marriage, and, and everything would be, would be lost. So at this dark time, I really didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't want to start murdering people, but I knew I was that far away from doing it. Now, at this time in my life, God began to intervene, which was good because I wouldn't know where I would have ended up otherwise. Uh, what happened was, is that I, every year I sent a check to the Church of Satan, my tithe to hell, so to speak. And when I got a check back from the bank during this period of my life, some lady at the bank had written on the check, I'll be praying for you in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Anyway, what happened was, I just laughed because at this time I was so screwed up, I thought Jesus was a vampire. And I just tossed the check in the file and forgot about it. But you know what happened? Within literally a day or two, my whole life fell apart around me. Within a day or two, I lost all my magical power. I lost all my vampiric power. I lost my job. I got sick as a dog. My wife even got sick. My whole life just it was like I was falling down face into the gutter and I didn't know what was going on I never connected it to because my ego was so great I mean understand something here I was probably one of the most powerful warlocks on the west coast of Lake Michigan and yet one praying Christian lady took me off at the kneecaps that is the power of prayer amen and, and I want to encourage you people, because if you're praying for someone, and I don't think there's too many people around that are as bound up in evil as I was. I mean, they're out there, but there aren't that many of them. And if you're praying for someone, be encouraged, because that is the power of prayer. And especially if you understand how to pray and bind the deceitful spirits that Satan has around that person and to loose the spirits of truth into that person's heart. Um, there's not much hope that, that person isn't going to get right with the Lord sooner or later. It took me about five or six years, but I finally got saved. So anyhow, I was in this dire strait. I didn't know what to do. Uh, I cried out to Lucifer for a sign. And I, I you know, because I, I was supposed to have all this great stuff happening to me, and instead my entire life was a shambles. And I said, what's going on here? I cried out for some kind of sign, and within a couple of days... Mormon missionaries knocked at our door. <laughs> and uh, the funny thing about that, now that might seem, well, that's interesting, but what does that have to do with the price of tea in China? Well, I'll tell you. What happens there is that I had been told many years earlier by this grand druid fellow down in Arkansas that if I ever got in really deep spiritual trouble, what I needed to do was join the Mormon church because the Mormon church had been started by witches, for witches, for the express purpose of... Giving, giving people a place, like, a, play, a place for people like me to hide out and appear to be nice, conservative, white-bred, Republican Christians, you know, even though we secretly believed all the same things that witches believed. Now, that might surprise you, but believe it or not, there's plenty of documentary evidence. We go into some of it in our book on the back table called Mormonism's Temple of Doom that, involved, that proves that Joseph Smith was, in fact, a warlock, the founder of the Mormon Church, and most of the early church leaders were deeply involved in sorcery. So anyway, we got into the church. We joined it. They, they loved us. We went through the ranks. I became an elders quorum president. We went to the temple. We had been told by this druid that it would be a profoundly occult experience. And guess what? He was right. It was the high point of our occult life. We, we really thought we were on the right track here because we were part of this huge, powerful, wealthy church. 
and yet we were still serving Lucifer. It was like the best of both worlds. In fact, we had a meeting about two days after we were sealed with Elder Faust, who at that time was one of the twelve apostles. Uh, I think he was the low man on a totem pole. That's like the ruling hierarchy of the entire Mormon church internationally. We got in there because we knew certain signs and words and tokens. And uh, he told us, after a lengthy interview, he bore us his solemn testimony that Lucifer was in fact the god of the Mormon temple. So, you know, we knew we were on the right track. Now, what's interesting about all this is I thought I had it made. But God had other ideas. And even though I was in a church where a lot of false doctrine was taught, you know, I, I say this. I say, if God can use a donkey to preach, he can use the Mormon church to get somebody saved. Amen? Understand this. This was the first time in my life that I had ever tried to be good. <laughs> Think about it. I mean, if you're, if you're a Satanist, you don't worry about being good. In fact, if you go through a day without breaking one of the Ten Commandments, you think you've had a bad day. But now, because I hope you all understand, Mormons are by and large very nice people. They try, try to live the commandments. They try to be good Christians. Of course, I hope you understand, you can't try to be a Christian. Any more than living in a garage makes you a Cadillac, amen? You just have to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, which Mormons are forbidden to have, that, that, and that's what does it. So I was trying very hard, and I was, I was struggling, and I knew there was something missing. And then the more, you see, again, God can turn things that are even evil into good. They called me to teach a class in the New Testament. And so even though I'd already had a master's degree in theology from the Catholic Church, I never read the New Testament. I never read the Paul, Paul's epistles. And for the first time in my life, I actually sat down and read the King James Bible, that's what the Mormons use, and I found out what was in the book of Romans. I found out what was in the book of Galatians. And I realized that there was no way that Paul could have been a Mormon. Amen? It just didn't work. I realized that I was a sinner and that I needed salvation. And uh, with a lot, it probably took me about six months of really studying and praying and fasting and doing all the things that Mormons are supposed to do when they're faced with a profound spiritual decision. But finally, and believe me, I'm giving you the short version here. Finally, on June 22, 1984, I decided I'd tried everything else. I might as well try this. And I, I took off my magic Mormon underwear because I didn't want any static on the line. Amen. I knelt down at the foot of my bed and I prayed the sinner's prayer and I gave my life to Jesus Christ. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So that's, that's the short version. If you want the full-length mini-series version, I'd suggest you check out Lucifer Dethroned out there because it has the whole story. Uh, anyway, I wanted to tell you that because I wanted you to see that I know a lot about what I'm about to speak. I am not an outsider. I was involved in this stuff. I was in it for 16 years, not counting the 20 or so years where I was just simply a devout Catholic. And so this is, this is stuff that's right from the horse's mouth or maybe the devil's mouth, as the case might be. Um, and I want to talk now about what's involved in this conspiracy. Um, it may surprise some of you, maybe not, because I know we have a well-informed bunch here tonight, amen. Uh, it may surprise some of you that if you had to put a name to the conspiracy that's come down to us through the ages, that some call the Illuminati, some other people call it other things, but I think if you boil it down to its purest, simplest form, you would identify it essentially as Freemasonry. Now that might surprise some of you. But understand that Masonry has been around a long, long time. It may not have always been called Freemasonry. But Masons itself brag about the fact that their first Mason was Tubal Cain. Now Tubal Cain, if you know your Bible, was the seventh man from Adam by way of Cain. And he was the guy that invented metalworking. And he is supposedly the first Mason. Now that's pretty far back to start a conspiracy. Then of course you have the flood. After the flood, the Masons say that the first Mason was Nimrod. Now, of course, we all know who Nimrod was. He's the guy that helped build the Tower of Babel. That's pretty good masonry, amen? And uh, he was the person who basically had the idea for a one-world government. He wanted to start a United Nations. And um, he had all these great ideas, you know, one-world government, all this kind of stuff, new world order. And God had other ideas. And God came down and he cast confusion 
and, and change the languages of the people. So they went and scattered abroad on the earth. That basically tells us what God thinks about the United Nations. Amen? So anyway, this caused the conspiracy to go underground. And for centuries it existed in various forms. And if, if, you, if you look in the, the books, the literature of Masonry, you will find that Masonry says it is the direct linear descendant from the ancient mystery religions, from the ancient fertility cults. Now what does that mean? That sounds sort of exciting and mysterious and exotic. Well, the ancient fertility cults were cults that revolved around human and animal reproduction. I'm sorry to be blunt, but that's what they mean. It's Baal worship, essentially. If you study the worship of Baal in the Bible, you've got all these false gods like Molech and uh, Baal and Chemosh and some of these others. All of them, their rites involve sexuality. And that's the same thing that masonry is. That's why the god of masonry is the phallus. That's why you have Masonic monuments like the Washington Monument that look like a giant phallic symbol. It's that simple. Um, so this is the conspiracy. And it may have been called many names, like, for example, before the time of Christ, masonry was called the Dionysian Artificers. Uh, later on, it was called the Gnostics, and we'll look at this more in detail in a couple of minutes. But I just want you to realize that even though it was called many things, just like the church, down through the centuries, the church, the true church of Jesus Christ had many different names, but it was the same basic thing. Well, it's the same thing with the devil's church, if you will. Now, people... People get on me about this, you know, and I, I, I get frustrated, I think, because they tell me, well, there's no such thing as a conspiracy. I get this from Christians all the time, and I feel like, you know, knocking on their heads and asking if there's anybody home up there, amen? You know, they say, oh, this is all nonsense. There's no conspiracy. The Bible doesn't say anything about a conspiracy. I mean, excuse me? You know, I mean, for example, just turn to the second psalm. It says in the first verse, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Now that's a conspiracy. Not only that, Jesus Christ himself discussed this very same thing. Um, and, and it's important to understand that the key thing of the, of the conspiracy is that it's done in secret. That's the essence of a conspiracy. Jesus Christ says in John 18, I believe it is, in secret have I done nothing. He taught everything openly. Christianity has no secrets. If you want to find out about what's so great about Christianity, we're delighted to tell you. We don't make you go through a bunch of dumb rituals and stand on your head or wear a blindfold or spit nickels while sitting in lotus position or anything like that. I mean, we're just delighted to share what Jesus Christ has done for us. Our lives are an open book. Our Bible is an open book. You know, there's no secrets. But, in the Masons and in all these other occult fraternities, it's all secretive. Now, Jesus himself addressed this. And he addressed it using a powerful metaphor, which runs like a, like a web of evil through the entire Bible. And if you go to Matthew chapter 16, you'll find that Jesus says something very important. He says, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now he's talking about leaven. What does that mean? Well, happily, we can look at other parts of the same chapter and Jesus defines it. In the same chapter in verse 12, it says that he was speaking of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So leaven is bad doctrine because we know both the Pharisees and the Sadducees were off into doctrinal error. The Sadducees were a lot like today's liberals. They denied the resurrection. They denied the existence of the supernatural realm. They denied uh, the spirit world and so on. And of course, we all know who the Pharisees were. Paul elaborated on this symbolism further. He said in 1 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8, your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Now that's, that's the key point of the conspiracy. Because if any of you have made bread, how much leaven, which is just yeast, does it take to make bread? Not very much, just a little bit. I mean, if you put too much in, you're going to have something that looks like the monster that devoured Cleveland sitting there on your countertop. Uh, you just take a little bit, and then you work the dough, and you work the dough, and what happens? The leaven disappears. It just sort of blends into the dough, and you can't even tell where it went but it starts percolating through the entire mass of dough until all of a sudden 
You've got the whole thing leavened. And that's how this works in the church. That's how the conspiracy works in society in general. If you've got one mason in your congregation, and especially if he's like a deacon or somewhere else in leadership, you're going to end up with um, a kind of one bad apple spoiling the whole barrel routine. That's percolating down and you're going to have all sorts of issues within your, within your local body. Similarly, if you have a mason in your family, his spiritual authority is going to percolate down and leaven the lives of, your, of the wife, of the children, of the grandchildren, of the great-grandchildren down three or four generations, and that's a curse that needs to be broken. Leaven like yeast is a living organism which is capable of reproducing itself, and that's what happens. You never just have one of these dudes in a church. They always start recruiting, because masons are like homosexuals. They can't reproduce themselves naturally. They can only, yeah, amen, they can only recruit. You know, think of that. That's the way with every cult. See, we are born again. Just like a baby is born out of the womb of its mother, we are born again. No other religion, no other cult can do that. Most especially the Masons. And so they have to recruit. Just like homosexuals are barren, they cannot reproduce themselves naturally, so they have to recruit. That's why you've got the Mormons and the Jehovah Witnesses knocking on your door, is because they're trying to recruit. They're not trying to do evangelism. They're not trying to win souls, because they, if they tried to win a soul, they'd be like a dog that chased a car and caught one. They wouldn't know what to do with it, amen? So this is the problem. They can't reproduce themselves, and so they do it in other ways. Now, the key element here to understand is the fact that Jesus, in another chapter, talks about the conspiracy of leaven in a very, very specific way. Now, I find this very interesting. I, I know what people are going to say when I talk about this. Oh, the chapter and verse numbers in the Bible aren't inspired and blah, 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 blah. But this is interesting. <laughs> if you go to Matthew chapter 13, verse 33. <laughs> now, think about it. Here you've got the 13th chapter of Matthew. And, of course, 13 is the number that's associated with witch covens and with the devil and all this kind of thing. And then you've got the number 33, like the 33rd degree Mason. Interesting coincidence. This chapter is the chapter where Jesus does all these fantastic parables about the kingdom. And in there he says, The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. Now, this is kind of a mysterious passage. And I'll tell you, if you talk to three or four different pastors, you're going to get three or four different exegeses of this passage. And I'm going to try and share with you what mine is, and I trust that it's going to be adequate to the purposes. What we've got here is, first of all, we need to identify the woman. It says a woman did this. Now, who is this woman? Well, some people say that this is the church, but I don't think that's correct. Because, first of all, nowhere in the rest of the Bible do you find a woman identified as a church, symbolically. The church is called the bride, the church is called the lamb's wife, but the church is never called just a woman. So that's one reason. There are other ways in which the woman term is used symbolically and prophetically, and that's what we're doing here tonight. We're looking at prophecy. So, prophetically speaking, a woman is used in a positive way as a symbol of Israel. For example, you have um, the woman in, uh, let's see, Isaiah 54, 6, Jeremiah 6, 2, or Revelation 12, 1. These are good women. I have likened Israel to a comely and delicate woman. This is Israel in a righteous state. But there's also Israel in a backslidden state. And this is also symbolized by a woman. For example, in Lamentations 1, 17, Ezekiel 16, 30, or Hosea 3, 1 where, for example, we have the prostitute Gomer as a symbol of backslidden Israel. Then finally, we have the famous woman, probably the most famous wicked woman in the Bible, which is the, the mystery Babylon in Revelation 17, the woman who is riding the beast. So it doesn't seem to me as though there's any prophetic justification for this woman being, in fact, the church. Now, what about the meal? Well, what is meal? Meal is ground up wheat, okay? What is wheat, symbolically? Well, happily, Jesus tells us that in this very chapter. He says, wheat is the children of the kingdom. 
See verses 25 through 30 and verse 38 of chapter 13. So we are the children of the kingdom. What's this ground up business? Well, think about it. How many of you ever seen actual wheat berries right off the branch, right off the stalk? I mean, they're like, kind of like tiny popcorn. You can't eat them. You can put them in a, in a jar of water and soak them and get them to sprout. Or you can grind them up and make flour, but you just can't eat wheat berries. They're utterly useless. And that's how we are. When we get born again, that we're not much used to Jesus. We have to be ground up and broken and made suitable to the master's service. Amen? That is the key here. So we are talking about the children of the kingdom. Now what does it say? It says that this is divided up into three measures of meal and then the leaven is put in each measure. So we got a division. Now if you th look back at the history of Christendom, basically you've got three major divisions of Christianity. You've got the Roman Catholic Church, the Orthodox Churches, and the Protestant Church. Pretty clear. Now if you think about it, the Roman Catholic Church has a lot of leaven in it, obviously. I mean, they've got idols, they've got doctrinal problems, they've got all sorts of weirdness going on, purgatory, rosaries, things like that. Uh, unfortunately, the Orthodox Church is not much better. They've got a little improvement, but not much. But then we've got the third one, the Protestant. What is the leaven in the Protestant churches? Well, I think we're going to find very readily that the leaven there is Freemasonry in point of fact. Let's look at this. Down through the years, there's been a fundamental symbol that is p part of the uh, occult. It's part of Freemasonry. And it's from a, a philosophy called the Kabbalah. Now, what, you may ask, is the Kabbalah? Well, it's an occult system of Jewish mysticism and magic that dates back to just before the time of Christ in the intertestamental period, between the time that Malachi wrote his book and the time that John the Baptist began his ministry. Now, the Kabbalah, we are told, is the philosophical core of Freemasonry. It is the ground philosophy behind Freemasonry. And this is its most central and its most important symbol. You will notice here we've got three pillars. The pillar of severity, the pillar of equilibrium, and the pillar of mercy. Now, the pillar of severity in Hebrew is called the Ima pillar. The pillar of mercy is called the Abba pillar. Now, you all probably know what Abba means in Hebrew. It means father. But Ima means mother. So this is the mother pillar and the father pillar. Now, this symbol is very rich in its, in its many, many layers of meaning. I could spend a whole evening just talking about all the different whales and ways in which it, is, um, which it is interpreted. But for now, we're going to look at it chronologically as a, as a, as a kind of a, a game plan for Satan's work down through the centuries. And we see here, for example, the pillar of mercy, the father pillar. What, what did Jesus call the Judaism of his day. He called it the traditions of the fathers. We today, even Bible scholars, in both Judaism and Christianity, will talk about the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's a patriarchal tradition. And so what we have here, this is the father or the patriarchal pillar. It represents apostate Judaism because we all understand that when the Jews ultimately turned their back on the message of Christ in Acts 7 when they stoned Stephen, what that ended up with is the light spiritually went out of Israel as a nation and Jews had to start getting saved the same way Gentiles did, one at a time. And, and God is not by any means finished with the Jewish people, but they right now they need to get saved just like everybody else does by the blood and the cross of Jesus Christ. They need to receive him as Messiah. Now, on the other hand, here's the mother pillar. What ecclesiastical institution calls itself the mother? Holy Mother of the Church, the Roman Catholic Church. Isn't that right? So we've got here apostate Catholicism on the other side. Now, you've got a, a female and a male, and they come together in the center. The pillar of equilibrium is obviously the balancing factor. And this balancing factor is the fact that these um, two other pillars 
bring together an androgynous figure, a figure that is both male and female. And what that is, is basically witchcraft and or Freemasonry. Because both witchcraft and Freemasonry have a bipolar god. They have a god that is male and female. That's why, for example, the Masons have the square and compass. It represents the god and the goddess, the male and female reproductive plumbing. If you want to see this broken down in a more complex way, <laughs> that's pretty complex. This is just since the 1800s. As you can see, Satan has been a busy little boy in the last few years. And uh, he's gotten a lot of stuff, but you'll notice the main trunk of the tree is still Babylonian witchcraft, which is really the same thing as masonry. And if you don't, I don't have time to document that in great detail, but if you go and look at my book, Masonry Beyond the Light, I go into that in a lot of depth. So this is what has happened down through the years, right up to the present day. And I was involved in about three-fourths of these little arrows that you see, and, and I can tell you quite categorically, it is all part of the same tree. Now, I don't expect to have the time to go into all of this, so I'm going to break this down and make it simpler for you. And we're going to talk about the path of Masonry's royal secret down through the centuries. Now, some of you may recall that, that on that certificate I had from the Scottish Rite, I had this wonderful title, Sublime Prince of the Royal Secret. Now, what does that mean? Well, the funny thing is, if you go up to a Mason and you ask a given Mason who's a 32nd degree Mason, what's the Royal Secret? You know what they're going to say? I don't know. <laughs> I even asked them this. I was myself a 32nd degree Mason, and they knew it. So it wasn't like they were trying to keep something from someone who wasn't worthy of this honor to know this. And I, I said, what's the royal secret? And they'd say, I don't have a clue. I don't know. <laughs> well, tonight, you're going to find out. You're going to learn something that only one in a hundred Masons knows anything about. And it's a horrible secret. It's a disgusting secret. There's nothing royal about it. But it's why it is kept so carefully guarded within the Masonic hierarchy. Let's look at this. We've talked about some of this already, and so I'm just going to kind of skip over it. We got the Babylonian and Egyptian mystery cults. That's where it all began with Nimrod. Then we have the Kabbalistic religions. I talked about that, the Kabbalah. Then we have the Gnostics. The Gnostics are basically people who believe that you are saved by secret knowledge, to put it simply. Gnosticism it comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge like diagnosis or prognosis. And what they believed is that Christianity, as it is constituted in the Bible, is far too simple. It's a Greek, it's a Greek heresy off of the truth of Christianity. And what it means is, is that you have to go through all sorts of elaborate rituals and details and deal with archons and aeons and logos and all these different things in order to receive salvation. Modern-day Gnostics would be examples, for example, uh, the Mormons, the Masons, a lot of New Agers, all these people believe they're saved by acquiring some sort of arcane, hidden wisdom. Okay, then we've got pre-Islamic sorcery and alchemy. I don't really have time to talk about that, but, but that in turn birthed what is called the assassin cult. Now, some of you may have heard of this. There was a group that came out of Orthodox Islam that was called the Ishmaelians. It was like a splinter group. And these Ishmaelians were a small but powerful heresy. And one of their chief leaders was a sheikh by the name of Hassan e Sabah. And this guy led a group that was called the Hashishim. Excuse me, that's where we get our word assassin, is from the, the Arabic word Hashishim. Now, why were they called Hashishim? Because the word means eaters of hashish. Now, most of you probably have heard of hashish. I hope none of you have tried it, but maybe some of you have. I certainly had my share in my day. Uh, hashish is a powerful form of marijuana, a distillation of its chemically active ingredient, delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, which is called THC for short, and it's what gives marijuana its hallucinogenic properties. So if you take hash, or as it's called colloquially, you get quite a buzz off it. And... Um, what, how this guy worked. He, was the, he is kind of the father of the modern-day conspiracy. He was the father of modern-day espionage. And he was the first programmer, the first mind control operator. 
And this is what he did. If someone wanted to join his group, he knew he needed elite warriors because he had all of Islam arrayed against him. And if any of you have studied Islam, you understand that it has a very interesting approach to soul winning. You come up to someone and you say, you're going to become a Muslim? If you say no, I'm going to cut your head off. That's how they worked. That is called jihad, holy war. That's why to this very day you will find certain Islamic factions that will think nothing of blowing themselves and dozens of other people up in what they believe is a service of their God, Allah. And so what happens is they believe if they die in jihad, in holy war, they will go straight to Islamic paradise. Now what's Islamic paradise like? Well, in the days of this uh, Hassan, what you had was the belief, first of all, there were no women in heaven. Sorry, no women. Because women didn't even have souls. Um, that's why even to this very day, women are treated very badly in the Islamic faith. Um, beyond that, when you died, you would go to a place called paradise where you could do all the stuff you weren't allowed to do as a Muslim. You could eat pork, you could drink wine, and there were these beautiful angels called Uris that looked just like Playboy centerfolds, and they would minister to your every whim throughout eternity. And this is the Islamic paradise. Now, what Hassan would do with one of these recruits, because he needed someone who was just a fanatic, and what he would do is he would bring this person in and feed them a sumptuous meal. And the meal would be laced with copious amounts of hashish. In other words, he'd get the guy really stoned. I mean, we're talking seriously stoned here. And then he would take him into a secret garden in the heart of his castle. And there would be beautiful women, all the pork he could eat, all the wine he could drink. And for three or four hours, the guy would just really enjoy himself. And then he would bring him back when he started coming down off the trip. And he would sit him in the chair and he would say, I have taken you to paradise. I have that power. If you serve me in jihad and die in my service, you will go straight to paradise for all eternity. What do you think the guy said? Where do I sign up? <laughs> you know. And these guys were total fanatics. I mean, they... He was famous for doing things like he'd have ten of them line up on a wall, he'd snap his fingers and they'd jump in unison a thousand feet to their deaths, grinning all the way, because they were dying in his service and they knew they would go straight to paradise. That's mind control, pure and simple. And it didn't stop there. He also invented the idea of the mole, not the little critters that dig up your lawn, but a, an agent an espionage agent who was hidden deep within the enemy organization and then when they were needed they would be called upon to do something. The story is told about a particular person, a caliph. Now a caliph was like a religious leader in medieval Islam who also was a, was a general. And this caliph came up against and tried to attack Hassan's castle. And Hassan sent him a message. And the message said, if you come any closer to me, you will die. And he laughed. The caliph just laughed. He says, I am surrounded by 150 retainers and bodyguards. Some of them have been with me for 15 or 20 years. Most of them are my own relatives. I am invincible. You can't touch me. The next morning, he woke up, and there were nine assassin daggers buried around his pillow on his head. Needless to say, he retreated. When uh, Hassan e Sabah died, his last word, he never was caught. He never was captured by the Orthodox Muslims. And on his deathbed, his last words were, nothing is true, everything is permissible. And those have become some of the bywords of the Illuminati that he had such a profound influence on. Okay, moving along, what happened next is the royal secret of masonry passed from the assassins to the Templars. Now the Knights Templar were warrior knights. They were Catholics that took part in the Crusades that you've probably all heard about. They went over to the Holy Land to try and capture the Holy Land back from the Saracens. Now the Saracens were a kind of Muslims. During this conflict, which lasted over a century, 
they began to interface with the um, assassins. They began to share each other's secrets. And so when they lost the Crusades, the Templars went back to Europe, immensely wealthy, immensely powerful, and full of occult knowledge. Now you've got to understand something about the Templars. They, they got very wealthy because they basically provided protection for the pilgrims as they journeyed from Europe to visit the sacred places in the Holy Land. And they got very, very wealthy. Plus there are legends that say that they found Solomon's treasure buried in the ruins of Solomon's temple in Jerusalem and that they were fabulously wealthy. They got so powerful and interestingly enough they became the first international banksters. Everybody tries to blame the Jews for that one but actually the first international banksters were in fact the, the Templars. And um, they got so powerful and so wealthy they threatened the Vatican which was not a wise thing to do. So the Pope got together with the King of France and they conspired to bring down the Templars. In 1307, on October 13th, Friday, they sent out warrants and captured every Knight Templar that they could find, including the Grand Master, whose name was Jacques de Molay. Now, Jacques de Molay was a pretty sinister fellow, and some of you may have heard of the Masonic Order, the de Molays. It's named after Jacques de Molay, believe it or not. And this, uh, this fellow was a pedophile, he enjoyed having sex with young boys. He was also an idolater. He worshipped an idol named Baphomet. And he was a practitioner of black magic. And this is the guy that the Masons idolize as a hero for their young boys. What I tell people is the name of a young boy's order after, Adam, uh, after, after Jacques de Molay is like having a Ted Bundy home for battered women. It's sort of a brutal irony, don't you think? So anyway, when de Molay, this wonderful spiritual giant, died, burned at the stake, and I don't advocate that, please. I mean, I think it was a horrible thing that they did to the Templars. He didn't die the death of a martyr. He wasn't like Stephen and said, you know, Lord, please forgive them. He cursed them. He cursed the Pope, and he cursed the king, and he said within a year they would both be dead. And within a year they both were. Now, whether that's because he was a powerful sorcerer or whether it was because there were assassins who did the job for him, we don't know. So, nobody knows what happened to the treasury of the Templars. It vanished. And the best guesses that we have is that it went up to Scotland where it was hidden along with some remnants because there are vestiges of Templar culture up in the highlands of Scotland that go back to the 1400s. Uh, the next thing is about a hundred years later along came the Rosicrucians. They had the same secret. Some people say that they were just a, a resurfacing of the Knights Templar under a different name. After that, just 34 years later, we have Ignatius Loyola and the Jesuits. Now Ignatius Loyola was a Spanish knight and he got hit in the leg with a cannonball and had to go through a lengthy convalescence. During that time he had some sort of conversion experience and decided this sounds familiar, I know. He wanted to start an order of warrior monks, elite warriors that would protect the Pope and would serve the Catholic Church unwaveringly. He came up with a name for this order. He called it Los Ilumbrados. Now, if any of you speak Spanish, you know that name means the Illuminated Ones. However, the Pope didn't like that name, and so they changed the name to the Society of Jesus. Um, What's interesting, yeah, it's a little more catchy, don't you think? Anyhow, what's interesting about this is that if you read the exercises which St. Ignatius developed, you will find that they are profoundly occult. You can get them in most bookstores. They're called the Spiritual Exercises of St. Ignatius Loyola. And they were the beginning of, of what ultimately came to be the Illuminati mind control exercises. The next thing that happened was about 100 years later, operative and speculative masonry began to be born. Now, the Masons have been around for centuries as a stonemason guild, very much like the day we have professional trade unions, like the Carpenters Guild or the Plumbers Union or whatever, where you go through and you become an apprentice and a journeyman and a master carpenter. Well, they had the same thing hundreds of years ago, except back then people were illiterate 
except for a handful of people like the clergy and some nobility, very few people could read. And so if I was like, say, a mason, and I came into a new place and I whipped out my local 122 mason card and handed it to the guy on the job site, he'd, eh, I don't know what this means. Uh, so instead, they developed a system of signs. Like, for example, if I would go like this, they would know I was an entered apprentice mason. Simple. So it started out innocently enough. But then when the Protestant Reformation came along, all the cathedrals were stopped. The great cathedral building of Europe basically ground to a halt. And that was where the Masons got most of their employment. And so to make up for that fact, the, um, the Masons began to admit non-operative Masons. And these came to be known as speculative Masons. These were people who were just simply interested in learning the occult philosophies of masonry. They didn't want to become stonemasons, and that, how the, that is how the masons stayed alive. This finally congealed formally into what is called the Mother Lodge in England in 1717. In London, at the Apple Tree Tavern, nice spiritual place, the first meeting formally of the Grand Lodge of England took place. And because most all modern masonry comes from that place, this is called the Mother Lodge. The next thing that happened is that the Grand Orient came along about 60 years later. That's the most virulent, anti-Christian form of masonry that exists in the world today. Just a few years after that, on May 1st, which is a high satanic holiday, a gentleman by the name of Adam Wieshaupt started a group called the Illuminati Ordinen, or the Order of the Illuminati. And uh, this is what we're going to try and focus a lot of our time on over the next few minutes because this is really the modern origins of the conspiracy. This is the guy right here. And as I said, his name is Adam Wieshaupt. He was a professor, Jesuit trained, in canon law at the University of Ingolstadt in Bavaria. And he got the idea that, gee, wouldn't it be a wonderful thing to have a society within the society of Freemasonry that would work for the abolition of the monarchy, of the church, and of the family, and bring people back to a wonderful state of pure paganism. So he started putting together a hell broth that mixed four different things together. Islamic mysticism and magic, Jesuit mind control techniques that we've already mentioned, Masonic secrets of immortality, and drug-induced altered states of consciousness. He put these four things together and began to infiltrate the Lodge all over Munich, all over Bavaria, and all over France. And uh, he, he pushed this as a system of replacing the monarchy and the church with a hierarchy of noble philosopher kings, naturally led by him, who would rule the world with benevolent wisdom. Like most fanatics, he had a plan. And as good conspiracies go, it was a good one. He worked his way deeply, especially into the ranks of the French. And if you want to see the fruits of true Illuminism, look at what is known as the French Revolution. The French Revolution exists as kind of an antimatter version, if you will, of the American Revolution. Whereas a lot of the people that were involved in the American Revolution were Christians. In the French Revolution, Illuminism was holding sway. Anti-Christian doctrine, the reign of terror, the guillotine, which ate up thousands and thousands of lives, including the crown heads of, of France. Uh, this was what Illuminism was really all about, unfortunately. And sadly enough, it culminated in an event where they desecrated Notre Dame Cathedral, they enthroned a half-naked prostitute on the high altar and crowned her as the goddess of reason and put a torch in her hand. And believe it or not, this is the origin of the Statue of Liberty. It's not a nice, wonderful thing about freedom. That torch is the light of Lucifer. And that statue was built by a mason was designed by a French Freemason as a gift to American Freemasons. So I'm sorry if I just popped anybody's bubble there, but 
the Statue of Liberty is not a nice symbol. It's a symbol of the goddess of witchcraft, essentially, holding aloft the light of Lucifer. Now, Adam Wieshaupt had a plan. He had a worldview. He thought history moved in a certain cycle. And he believed that if he could catch these cycles, it would basically enable him to rule the world. He saw history as being divided into five stages, and you see them there. This is called the Law of Fives. You have chaos, discord, confusion, bureaucracy, and aftermath. And here's how it worked. In chaos was what Adam Wieshaupt believed was mankind's best and purest state. Excuse me, it was a state of what we would today call paganism, where you're just like the noble savage of Rousseau, hopping through the forest, gathering herbs, hugging trees. I mean, Al Gore would love this. You know, um, basically being a witch and worshiping a mother goddess and everything is happy and joyful and tra-la-la-la-la. Well, needless to say, this couldn't last forever. Into this Edenic state comes the serpent. Except in this case, the serpent's name is Jehovah. And Jehovah brings with him the evil cult of monotheism. Now, monotheism is the belief that there's only one true living God. That's what Jews believe, that's what Christians believe, and it's even what Muslims believe. But it's diametrically opposed to paganism. And this is why pagans hate Christians so much, is that we insist that we've got the only right way. If you talk to a witch, they'll say something like, well, that's your truth, and I've got my truth, and all there's everybody's got their own truth, and it's blah, 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 you know, it's sort of like you know they've got cream filling between their ears, amen. Anyway, that's why we call New Agers Twinkies; they got cream filling between their ears. Um, anyway, what happened is that the the evil monotheist, according to Wieshaupt, this isn't me; this is him talking, so to speak that they oppressed the happy pagans and made them follow rules. They made them stop fornicating in the bushes with everything that moved. They made them stop smoking dope. They made them stop worshiping false gods. They took all their fun away. And this caused a lot of discord and a lot of confusion because the pagans kept wanting to keep doing all of this stuff because it was fun. And so this caused the third stage to come along. And the third stage is confusion. And this happened because, the, you see, the, um, the monotheists had to come up with a reason for why these stupid pagans were still insisting on doing this. And so they invented the idea of the devil. And the devil was making them do it. And so they tried to introduce a devil figure to, uh, to explain the problems they were having, but that didn't work. So the synthesis of stage three failed, and this leads to stage four, which is bureaucracy. I'm sure none of us have any idea of what that is like. And um, what you've got here is this philosophy that emerges where everything must be carefully tracked because the average people, that's you and, you and me folks, are dumb. We're as dumb as a mud fence. We couldn't even find our way out of our pajamas without the government's help. Isn't that right? You know? And, and so they micromanage everything. You know, it's like the nanny state. Take care of this. Take care of that. Do this. Fill out this form. You know, it's like they think we can't even, you know, get dressed and go to work without the government's help anymore. And, and in fact, I, I just ran into an interesting example of this kind of mentality. There was a fellow on the news a couple weeks ago who, um, he, he sued Lawn Boy, the lawnmower company, because what he tried to do is take his Lawn Boy lawnmower and trim his hedge with it. And he hurt himself. You know, duh. Anyway, he sued Lawn Boy because he said, you guys should have had a sticker on that lawnmower that said, warning, do not use this to trim hedges or you might lose significant parts of your anatomy. You know? And he won! I mean, and, and this is why everything you buy now has 50 stickers on it. It's because the government treats us as if we're all have the mental capacity of the average doorknob. And, and this makes us feel frustrated. It makes us feel alienated. And that's exactly what he wanted.
That's exactly what VSOP wants because when people get frustrated and they get alienated, what do they do? <coughs> they start smoking dope, they start getting drunk, they start retreating into fantasies, you know, like Star Wars or Star Trek or soap operas or, you know, romance novels or whatever the case might be. And as a result of this, most people end up on the dole or in mental hospitals. This starts eating away at the middle class. And of course, the middle class, <coughs> excuse me, is a source of all capital. And so eventually, the society runs out of money, unless it starts counterfeiting, which of course is what's going on today. Um, and what happens is the whole thing collapses of its own weight and we end up with aftermath, where the whole thing kind of implodes and falls into ultimate chaos. And then we start over again with the happy pagans. Except this time, the happy pagans are ruled over by a benign philosopher king named Adam Wieshaupt. So this was his plan. This is the basic worldview of the Illuminati, and that is reflected in terms of its penetration into masonry I'm going to show you here a blow-up of my Scottish Rite certificate. And notice what you see up there. Right under the all-seeing eye, it says Ordo Ab Cal. That's Latin. It means order out of chaos. And that's just what I was talking about. This is like the Hegelian dialectic, it's called in philosophy. It's uh, simply put, you, you artificially create a crisis and then you provide a solution to the crisis, which of course involves more bureaucracy and more government regulations. And all of a sudden, you've had more of your freedom chewed up by some bureaucrat. And this is the idea behind the whole Illuminati game plan. Now, he believed this theory to be true. And he had infiltrated many of the lodges. And, and it was, the balloon was almost ready to go up. He was ready to bring down the crown heads of Europe. But God, those are two of my favorite words in the Bible, by the way. But God had other ideas. And believe it or not, an Illuminati courier was galloping through the night, and he was hit by a lightning bolt. I'm not kidding. This is history, folks. And he was blown to bits. He became a Christy critter for day Satan. And um, this happened in 1785. And when the body was found by authorities, they discovered a saddlebag full of all these secret plans. They broke the code, and they went out and they arrested everybody they could lay their hands on. And the conspiracy was broken. But not before it had so thoroughly enmeshed itself into masonry that there was no way to tell where Illuminism ended and masonry began. It was like sort of a weird spiritual cloning that went on. And this fusion of sorcery with statecraft, which Wieshaupt began, was brought to an even higher level by a gentleman named Albert Pike and Giuseppe Mazzini in the 19th century. And it has tooled Freemasonry into the dangerous machine that it is today as part of the international conspiracy. Okay. Um, what's actually going on here? in terms of becoming an Illuminatus. I mean, people have asked me, well, you were actually in the Illuminati. How do you join? I mean, do you find a little ad in the back of Fate magazine and fill it out and send in $25 and poing, you're an Illuminati? No, it's not quite that easy. Uh, you've got to understand that the Masonic order is like an onion. It stinks. No, more to it than that. An onion has layer after layer after layer after layer. And the outer layers don't know what's going on in the inner layers. This is the way secret societies are designed. This is the way cults are designed. That's why the typical Mason doesn't have a clue about anything that I'm talking about tonight. And if you're a Mason sitting here tonight and you're saying, this guy is full of beans, let me tell you, I know whatever I speak. It's just that you have not been told any of these things because 99 out of 100 Masons are never allowed to know these things. Now, on the other hand, what happens is you get involved in the Masons and if you know certain things and you know how to say certain keywords and certain signs and certain tokens and certain points of entrance, you are brought into a whole different kind of Masonry that does not involve the normal Masonry that most Masons experience. You begin to learn the secrets of Illuminism. And then they use a cell approach. Now what do I mean by that? It's just like those of you that may have studied the Communist Party in the 50s and 60s, they had cells. 
And that meant, I didn't mean they lived in jail cells, it meant that they had a thing where they only, each communist only knew two other communists. And that way, if one of them was arrested or something, they couldn't bring down the whole organization. When I was in Milwaukee, I only knew two other people who were in the Illuminati. And then one of them knew somebody higher up that we could communicate with. So, this is how it works. There's a sifting process that goes on. The way they go is they bring in the Masons by the dozens. Although actually right now Masons are kind of hurting for members in most parts of the country. Praise the Lord. Amen. But, uh, and I, I would like to think it's because of revival or because of the prayers of the saints, but actually I think it's because people would rather stay home and watch cable TV. But uh, anyway, um, there's three kinds of Masons which seem to be drawn into the deeper aspects of Illuminism. First of all, those with special hereditary bloodlines and preparation. Secondly, those who come to Masonry already prepared with an occult background. Now that was me. I was already a witch high priest when I joined the lodge. And I had all these nice little familiar spirits and ascended masters, actually they were demons, uh, whispering things in my ear. And so when I went through the rituals, I would say certain things that would sort of trip off a lever somewhere, and I would be shunted off the main line of masonry into a little side spur, so to speak, where all of a sudden I would be taught the deeper mysteries, and I would be admitted into the deeper things of the lodge. Then the third kind of person that gets into the Illuminati is those who are perceived as being wealthy, powerful, or the right temperament. Some of these people might not even have to become Masons. You know, like, for example, Nixon was involved in the Illuminati. And, and many of the other powerful people in our government are Illuminists, and some of them may not have even actually been Masons. But they were so powerful that it was seen that they could be a, a, a worthy part of the conspiracy. Now, what happens as a result of all of this is that these people are gradually brought into ever higher and higher levels of seduction. They are prepared emotionally and psychologically to receive the inner teaching. Uh, they are taught forms of meditation and mind control, beginning with the spiritual exercises of the Jesuits. They are taught the tantric principles of yoga. That's the yoga of sexuality, especially the left-handed path. And don't worry if you don't know what that is. I'm going to have to talk about it, unfortunately, in a few minutes. Then they are introduced to hallucinogens and certain secret formulations that are used to open the third eye and bring about what is called enlightenment. Then they are taught the basic principles of occult Freemasonry, which is called archaeometry. And what, might you ask, is archaeometry? Well, in the point of fact, it is something where you learn how to build temples that are suitable habitations for demon spirits. Isn't that a wonderful thing to learn? Anyway, now remember about the Law of Fives. Well, in, in, in Illuminism, you go through five stages. These are the five steps into the light. The first stage is adoption. This is fellowship with Lucifer. Now what does that mean? Well, you've got to realize Satan is an inveterate copycat. He can't come up with anything creative because he has cut himself off from God who is the source of all creativity. So all he can do is recycle the same old gobbledygook over and over again. That's, we have a saying, we, you know, you can't teach an old snake new tricks, amen? And so they just, he just keeps trying to do the same thing. And he, he lusts after the kind of stuff that God has. He wants to be worshipped as God. And, and so when he sees Christians being adopted into the family of God, he figures he's going to try and do the same thing with his slaves. And so, and this is, this is something very important that you need to understand. If, if you know someone who's a Mason or if you yourself are a Mason, realize that when you kneel at the altar of masonry as an entered apprentice and you take that oath, you are adopted into the family of Lucifer at that moment. Now, you don't probably know that. I did. But most people don't even know that. And as a result, if you're a Christian, mind you, there are pastors that are doing this. There are deacons that are doing this. There are countless Christian lay people that are doing this. And they're ending up with having one knee on the altar of Baal and one knee on the altar of God, and the altars are moving farther and farther apart as we get closer to the end times. Amen? And so these people are in a very uncomfortable position, and something has to give. And usually, unfortunately, it's their Christian walk. 
You cannot serve two masters. And when a person enters the lodge, they take an oath that they will obey every summons of the worshipful master of their lodge, if within the length of a cable tow. And so they're serving two masters, quite simply. Um, whether they know it or not, they have linked themselves to the devil, and I can prove it to you. In the Masonic ritual, which I had to learn, when you're kneeling at the altar and you've taken this blood-curdling oath, which Christians are forbidden to do, by the way, see Matthew 5, 34 through 37, when you take this oath, then they take the blindfold off, and the worshipful master says, Brother Senior, War Senior Deacon, please remove the cable toe from about our brother's neck because he is now bound by a much stronger tie to our fraternity. So there's a spiritual tie that is created at that moment, a spiritual link. And if you understood the profound relationship between witchcraft and Freemasonry, you would know what that cord, that cable toe meant, because they've got a rope around their neck. And what that means in witchcraft and the occult is that is a symbol of the umbilical cord of the mother goddess, the queen of heaven, linking her to her hidden child. So this guy has just been born again by the queen of hell, the consort of Lucifer. And every entered apprentice mason, in other words, every mason has this happen to them. And they don't understand the dynamics, probably 99 out of 100, but they still go through it. Now what's the next step? Well, it's called illumination. And every mason goes through this too, except it usually doesn't work very well for them. <laughs> what I mean by that is there's a point in the Masonic ritual, just seconds before what I just discussed, where the guy has taken the oath, and then the worshipful master begins reading solemnly out of the Bible, Genesis 1, 1 and 2. And when he says, and God said, let there be light, all the masons in the room clap their hands, and the blindfold off the guy's eyes is removed. And by the light of three burning tapers, he sees on the altar the Holy Bible with the square and compasses laying on it. And this is supposed to give him an altered state of consciousness. Usually all it gives him is a slight headache. Um, then later on, he gets another consciousness-raising experience. And this is third degree. And in third degree, he gets to play the part of the Christ of, a, of, of masonry, which is a guy named Hiram Beef, He's blindfolded, dragged around the lodge, accosted it three separate times. The third time, he's knocked on the head by a rubber setting mall, knocked head over heels into a, into a trampoline, trundled about the lodge, buried under a bunch of rubble, and then raised from the dead by the strong grip of the lion's paw, and he learns the secret word of the Master Mason degree. And all of this is supposed to alter his consciousness. However, it doesn't usually do that much unless they've also been doing the Illuminati exercises. And so what is involved there is that gradually you begin to open up your third eye. Now that might be an unfamiliar term to some of you, but the third eye in the occult is called the Ajna Chakra. It's an energy center here, and if it's opened up, supposedly it gives you psychic powers. It gives you the ability to see auras. It gives you the ability to astrally project, to see the future, things like this. Of course, this is all demonic. So what happens is, is gradually, and this happened to me, I went through an experience where I was deluged in the blinding white light of Lucifer. It felt like my brain was being parboiled in pure light. I cried out in agony. It drove me to my knees. It hurt so badly. And, and I received the consciousness of Lucifer. I was illuminated. And this is what it means to become an Illuminatus. It's just a Latin word for illuminated one. And what this means is that gradually something happens to your mind. It's like a satanic virus is introduced into your mind. And just like a computer virus, it begins to overwrite the human software of your brain with evil. With something that's a lack of compassion, a lack of mercy, you begin to look at human beings as if they were cattle or bugs you begin to have just, it, it's hard for me to even talk about because I'm so ashamed of it. This is supposed to bring a quantum leap forward in consciousness and create a higher form of humanity which is called Homo Noeticus, the new man who is as far above human beings as you are above cats and dogs. 
The next stage is conversation. What this means is you have communion with the mighty dead. And what that means, essentially, is that you talk with dead people that are supposedly very wise. Like, for example, I, again, as I mentioned, was a trans-channeler. And I would have conversations one weekend with Jesus, the next weekend with Buddha, the next weekend with Zoroaster, the next weekend with Hitler, the next weekend with Aleister Crowley. I was very ecumenical. And um, gradually, this is supposed to increase your level of knowledge, your level of wisdom, your level of occult power. And that was preparing you for the next stage. And this is what is called Congress. And no, that doesn't mean you become a congressman. What this means is you, you have to have sex with a fallen angel. And this is a very appalling and bizarre process. And it really nearly destroys every human being who has to go through it. It nearly killed me. And I was actually, I went through a formal marriage with a fallen angelic being. And of course you understand there's a biblical principle at work here which Satan is using. And that is when you have sex with someone you become one flesh with that person. And what happens at that point is you become so demon-possessed that it's like burbling up here around your eyeballs. I mean, you know, I had more demons per cubic centimeter than the entire city of Indianapolis, let me tell you. And um, the result of that is that you just become a pretty vile, evil person. And then the following stage, and I just thank God that Jesus got me out of this before I got to stage five, is union. And this is where you become utterly one with Lucifer. You have so many demons inside of you that there ain't nobody home up here but the demons. And there are people like this walking around. I mean, you know, people like Adolf Hitler, people like Charles Manson. And, and I'm not saying that these people couldn't be saved because they probably could, but I know it was very painful for some of the stuff I had to go through to get out of this. And I, I just praise God that he got me out of it before it was too late. Now, I want to explain something about this, because oftentimes when you start talking about the conspiracy, how many of you have heard this? There can't be a conspiracy like this, because people can't keep secrets. The government can't even keep anything secret. Well, frankly, I think the government is keeping a lot more secret than anybody really realizes, amen? But beyond that, there's a reason why this can be kept secret, and I'm going to explain it to you from the inside out. What happens here is you've got a whole nest of demons in your mind. And if you even start thinking about betraying the brotherhood, if you even start thinking about going to the media or going to talk to somebody that could be dangerous, these demons know just where the pain centers are in your brain. And they can instantly inflict upon your brain through just electrical nerve stimulation such agony that it makes the pain a woman goes through when she has a baby seem like a walk in the park without any kind of outside scarring or any kind of bruising or anything. You think you're dying. You wish you would die. And all it takes is a couple of seconds of that and you rethink your plans to betray the Brotherhood. Also because of this, and especially at this level, I only slightly experienced it at level four, it's almost like you're part of a giant organism. It's like your brain is just the cell of a larger brain. And, and the whole thing moves in unison. And, it, and it's sublimely malignant how perfectly this thing usually works unless God intervenes. Amen? And what happens is if, if you decide that you're going to go through this and you can fight your way through the pain, these demons will just cause a cerebral hemorrhage in your brain and you'll just drop dead in less than three minutes. Now the only way you can get around this is if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, and that's what happened to me. I mean, Jesus can stop this process, but otherwise it's almost impossible to do this. The other reason, now I talked to you about the stick. Now I'm going to talk to you about the carrot. There's a carrot involved here, too, and that is the promise of immortality. You are told that because you've had this sexual marriage with a fallen angel, that you are on your path to immortality that you will live forever. And that's pretty neat, if you really believe it. But as you will find out in a couple minutes, the uh, price that you have to pay for this supposed immortality 
is so profound and so evil that very few, few of us would ever want to pay it. It's important to understand that the price involves a kind of spiritual and sexual pyramid scheme of immense power, and I'm going to explain that. Most all of us, well, I think all of us, in fact, have seen this because it's on the back of our dollar bill. Amen? This is the back of the Great Seal of the United States. And I doubt if it's news to many of you that this is also a highly constructed occult Masonic symbol. Uh, you've got here Anuit Chaped at Novus Ordo Seclorum. This year begins the New World Order. So when you hear people talking about the New World Order, that's not a new thing. This term has been around for at least a couple, three centuries, if not before that. And then you'll notice here the Roman numerals, 1776. Now everybody thinks, oh, isn't that wonderful? That's when the Declaration of Independence was signed. Yeah, but that wasn't when America was founded. America didn't really officially start as the United States until the Articles of Confederation were signed. And as a result, let's look at something else that began on May 1st, 1776. That's a high satanic holiday called Beltane. And that is the beginning of the Illuminati. That is what was started, a new world order in 1776. Now, notice here there's 13 ranks in this pyramid. And I'm going to talk to you about what that means. Now, I'm going to kind of crack this code. And there's, this is, excuse me, it's important to understand that like any occultic symbol, this has multi-layers of meaning. And what I'm showing you today is not the only way to decode it, but it's the relevant way for our purposes this evening. This is how you break that down. If you'll notice, the lower levels here are the, the well-known U.S. Masonic degrees. They form the foundation of the pyramid. And then beyond that, you have, for example, the order of the trapezoid. That's, that's the beginning order of Satanism. Then you have the ancient and primitive rite of Memphis and Mizraim. That's the 97 degrees. Then you have the Ordo Templi Orientis. That's Crowley's brand of sexual masonry. Then you have the Palladium. The Palladium is where you have to marry a demon or a fallen angel. Then you have the Illuminati. I got one degree into that and then the Lord pulled me out of it, praise God. Above them are the nine unknown men. These are, are men, sorry, no women, ladies. These are men who are extremely super high-level occult masters who are selected, each one of them, to reign over a continent. And I used to know who the guy was that was over North America, but he's now deceased. And um, these men, in return, report to a group that's called the Seven. And these Seven are very, very powerful fallen angels. They're what, is the, what the Bible calls principalities. And they, in turn, report to the great architect of the universe, Lucifer himself. His title in Hebrew is Ayan Sof Or which translates as the light of limitless nothingness. In other words, Lucifer is a big zero. Um, and this is the hierarchy in basic form. I mean, you could break this down in other ways, but what I want you to understand is it's a giant spiritual, financial, and sexual pyramid scheme. What do I mean by that? Well, all of this stuff costs money. And I think you all understand how a pyramid scheme works. You get a lot of people on the bottom to give a little bit of money, and the people on the top get rich. And then they run off of the money into the Cayman Islands or something. That's why this is illegal. But what happens here is you've got all these people, like, for example, when I went through the Blue Lodge, it cost me about $150 worth of de to get degrees. Now, that was in the 70s. It's probably twice that today. And then I had to pay $150 for the Scottish Rite. I think I had to pay $130 for the York Rite. I had to pay another $150 for the shrine, plus annual dues for all of these things. Now, in addition, there's dues for all of these things up here. And all this stuff adds up. These people are getting very, very wealthy. And if you don't believe me, look at the, look at the shrine temple in your community. That thing is incredibly, incredibly ornate. And all the money that, you know, like they have, do they have a shrine circus here once a year? They talk about their crippled children and all this stuff. 
I mean, we were driving down the highway coming up here, and we'd pass all these semis, and they'd have these, these little plaques on the back saying, oh, the Shriners help the crippled children. Yeah, right. The problem is, is that most of that money doesn't go to those crippled children. Only 3 to 4% of that money goes to the hospitals. The other 95% of it goes somewhere else. And that's allowed by the tax laws in this country. So th there's a tremendous amount of money being filtered upward by this. Now, additionally, there's a tremendous amount of energy. Think about this. There's all of these rituals going on all over the world. Like in my personal case, when I was involved in this stuff, I was going to rituals four nights a week. And Satan is up at the top of this pyramid receiving all of this as worship, even though it's boring. I mean, you know, I'll tell you, it is more interesting to watch an ice cube melt than it is to sit through most Masonic meetings. And if any of you are former Masons, you can probably give me a hearty amen to that. I mean, it's just, it's just, forget it. Uh, and, and yet Satan loves this because he's an egomaniac. He wants to be like God. He wants to receive our worship. And that's what he does with all these rituals. But there's also a profoundly sinister aspect of this which I must get into. And I'm, I apologize in advance because some of this is going to be kind of gross. But we have to talk about the royal secret of masonry and how that fits into this spiritual pyramid scheme. Realize that when you join the Masons, you become yoked to sterling citizens like this. This is a list of all of the prominent occultists of the 20th century. All the witches, all the ceremonial magicians, all the Satanists, all of the theosophists and New Agers that are really movers and shakers of late 19th and early 20th century. Every single one of them was a Mason, a very high-level Mason. Now, what does that tell you? I knew many people, and now some, most of these are now deceased, probably frying in hell. But, but even in my lifetime, when I was a Mason, I knew many, many fellow Masons that were occultists, that were devil worshipers. Now, if you're a Mason and you're a Christian, you're yoked to those people by a spiritual tie that's much stronger than any rope. And what does the Bible tell us in 2 Corinthians 6? It says, Be not unequally yoked with unbelievers. What fellowship hath, hath light with darkness? What, fe what concord hath Christ with Belial? It's that simple. You are yoked with a bunch of devil worshipers. And if you are a Mason, you need to repent of that and get out of it because it's like a stinking, dead albatross around your neck. And not only is it dragging your Christian walk down if you really are saved, it's dragging your family down and your children down through generational curses. So this is the danger here. And there's an even more profound danger. I've talked about this guy by name, and I don't think I bothered to formally introduce him. Isn't he a cutie? This is Edward Alexander Crowley, also known as Alistair Crowley. He styled himself the wickedest man in the world. He believed himself to be the great beast. And he changed his name to Alistair Crowley, so he, it would add up in both English, Hebrew, and Greek Kabbalah as 666. In 1904... Crowley had a communication with an extraterrestrial being named Ewas. And this being, through his wife, <clears throat> kind of a channeling type operation, excuse me, brought forth a book that was called The Book of the Law in 1904. And this book declared that the slain and risen God, i.e. Jesus, had stepped off the throne and that a new God, the crowned and conquering child, was taking his place. And as a result of this, Crowley proclaimed the end of Christianity and the start of Crowleyanity. Obviously, the guy had no self-esteem problems. Uh, in fact, he was a brilliant genius. He could play eight chess games blindfolded. He was an accomplished poet, mountaineer, painter, writer. He had so many Masonic degrees that you could fill up five pages of a book with them. This guy was probably the most highly honored Mason in the world. And he was also the most dangerous man of the 20th century. And he began doing rituals to bring forth this crowned and conquering child. And he began to start what he called the cult of the fascinating child. 
And in doing this, he uncovered, without knowing it, the royal secret of masonry. And what happened was, a gentleman came knocking at his door after he published a book. And in this book, he'd, it was a book of poetry, and in the book he had made an allusion to something. And this guy, named, his name was Theodore Royce. He was a German occultist and the head of the OTO, the Ordo Templi Orientis, which stands for the Order of Eastern Templars. There's the Knights Templar again. And this Theodore Royce told Crowley that he had given away the greatest secret in occult history. And Crowley said, what do you mean? I don't even understand it. So the guy promptly initiated him on the spot to the ninth degree of the OTO and then explained the secret to him. And you're about to learn what this secret is. The secret is that as a Mason, you are promised immortality. If you go to a Masonic funeral, you will hear them discuss the immortality issue. You will hear them promise that they will go to the Celestial Lodge above and live there forever. How do they get this immortality? They don't believe in Jesus. The name of Jesus is not allowed to be mentioned in the Blue Lodge of Freemasonry. And, and while there are probably many Masons in this nation that are either nominal or even professing Christians, that doesn't enter into this discussion because it's not mentioned in the funeral. Where do they get their promise of immortality? Simply, the secret that Crowley uncovered, probably through demonic intervention, is the secret that this immortality is conveyed through tantric sex magic. And the kind of sex magic that is, we're talking about here, unfortunately, is the sexual violation of a little child. Crowley taught that the way you could live forever was by vampirizing little children sexually. And he personally bragged of having slaughtered 150 male children in one year. This is why he was called the wickedest man in the world. Uh, and this, I apologize that this is so horrible, but, but Masons are doing this. Not all Masons, please understand me. Probably one in a hundred knows about this. But this is a significant enough problem that I feel compelled to share it with you. In our ministry, with one accord, we have had to pray for literally hundreds of people who are the relatives of Masons either children, grandchildren, nephews, nieces, whatever, and they have been sexually violated by their Masonic relatives, often in Masonic temples. This is why the Masons believe that they will live forever. They think every time they defile a little child, they steal some of that child's youth. And if you notice, children are sexually abused do age more rapidly because their innocence has been stolen. What happens then is they believe that they are accessing alternate universes, alternate realities where they can become as gods. And I believe that this is why, because this man has been making, it was, was doing these kind of rituals right up until his death in 1947, that we today have an epidemic of child abuse on our hands. Now, the, the final thing I have to share about this, and then we're going to be... Uh, closing for the break is the meaning of this and this is a very mysterious symbol which uh, you know you've heard all sorts of explanations for it but I'm going to give you the the Masonic Illuminati inner meaning of what this means tonight and it's going to probably gross you out and astonish you and I apologize in advance for that but this is what it means Crowley reveals the secret behind the all-seeing eye symbol in one of his books, the Book of Thoth, which is a very advanced manual on tarot card readings. And um, this is the eye of Lucifer. But believe it or not, it corresponds to a human organ that, for lack of a more delicate term, we'll call the rectum, and which is kind of ironic when you think about it, that this represents Lucifer. And what this refers to is that the occult archaeometric doctrine of masonry is that by accessing alternate universes through sodomy, especially of young boys, you can access alternate dimensions of reality through what are called the tunnels of Typhon. Now, you remember I showed you earlier a map of the Tree of Life. Well, everything in magic 
like everything in the occult, has its yin and yang. It's positive and it's negative. It's good and evil. There's always this dynamism. And so therefore, just like there is a tree of life, there is also a tree of evil. This is called the klephot in Hebrew, which translated means harlots. And you'll notice here that all of the names are all evil. And these Typhonian tunnels are the paths between these ten evil worlds. Now, if you want a little bit more on this than I have time to get into right now, you can read the book Lucifer Dethroned because it does go into it. But here is what is ultimately involved. There, there is a belief that through this sexual perversion, they can access these tunnels into alternate universes, alternate realities. And the goal of this kind of magic is to find your own universe and become the god over that universe. This buys into the, to the modern day physics theory that there's many, many dimensions of reality. I, maybe you've read about that. Alternate universes. It shows up in science fiction a lot. And, and then once you're the god of this universe, you can start sucking the energy out of it. And you can use that energy through this child to live forever and ever and ever. And there are men, I, I, I have met several that claim to be hundreds of years old. Now, of course, are they lying their lips off? I frankly think they are. This is a deception. Satan is deceiving these people to draw them into all kinds of profound evil. But the, the important point is not, does this really work? The important point is, do these people believe it? And sadly, they do. And this broad genre of magic is called, and here's a nice big word for you, transuguthian magic. And all that means is, is it's, it's magic that goes into trans-Plutonian space, space beyond the planet Pluto, which they believe is beyond the pale of the sun and therefore beyond the pale of the Judeo-Christian God. They believe there are gods out beyond Pluto that are far more powerful and far more dangerous and far more deadly than either God or the devil. And that's what these beings, these men, are trying to access. Now, please understand me. I can't say this strongly enough. Only probably one or two out of a hundred Masons is doing this. But that's more than we need. Amen? I mean, we're getting... This is such a problem that we are actually... I now know of five national support groups that are helping people that are survivors of Masonic ritual abuse. This is that serious a problem. And let me tell you something else. The other 95, 96, 97 Masons have an even bigger problem. Because the spiritual headship over their organization trickles back down to this monster. And because of that, even if they're good men, even if they don't know about this, you know what happens? They begin to struggle even if they're Christians, with profound temptations to move in this area of pedophilia and homosexuality. And this is dangerous stuff. I mean, this is spreading throughout the world like a plague. We have organizations like NAMBLA, the National Association of Man-Boy Love, which their slogan is, Sex Before Eight or It's Too Late. And they're trying to lower the age of consent to eight years old. And all of this can be laid at the door of this occult monstrosity. Now here, here's the issue. Just like, you know, we have a saying in the state where I come from. You lie down with dogs, you get up with fleas, amen? If you're a Mason and you're in an organization with this kind of spiritual headship, this is all around you and you don't even know it. It's like a fish swimming in polluted water that's full of spiritual sewage. And you can't help but take this into yourself. And even if you're a Christian, this is going to have an impact on you. Even if you are, I mean, even in my case, and I wasn't a Christian at this time by any extent of the imagination, but it's important to understand that in all of this, that I myself, as a normal, red-blooded, heterosexual, was finding myself continually drawn into sexual thoughts and sexual fantasies about little boys. I thank God I never acted on any of that. But it was being forced on me because I was under the umbrella of the Masonic leadership. 
and it, it, it is really a very tragic thing, but it is, it is very real, this kind of headship. So the, the bottom line here is that you cannot be a part of this and be a follower of Jesus Christ. I heard another brother say it this way, you cannot at the same time be, in, be an intelligent Mason and an intelligent Christian. It's that simple. Now, people ask me, what's the big deal about all of this? And I, I'm going to end this with something a little bit more uplifting, because I know that probably just demade, dismayed the living daylights out of everybody. Um, this is a very important symbol in Masonry and in, this, and in Satanism. It's called a trapezoid. Doesn't it bother you a little? Doesn't it look unfinished somehow? That's the idea. In architecture, this is called a frustrum because it frustrates people. And this is believed by Masons who understand this stuff to be the ideal shape for manifesting demons. That's why Masonic altars are all built in a trapezoidal shape. That's why haunted houses often have roofs that are called mansard roofs. It seems to attract more demon spirits. Now here's the deal. You put this on top of this, and you've got the thing that's back on the dollar bill. But notice something. Let's go back to the original symbol. Why is this incomplete? What does that mean? Nothing in this thing is there by accident. Nothing in this symbol is there by accident. This is incomplete because the capstone is missing. What did Jesus Christ say in Matthew 21? He says, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected the same has become the head of the corner? Now I ask you, what, is the head, what stone can be a headstone and a cornerstone at the same time? The top of a pyramid. And Jesus Christ is the capstone of this pyramid because it is an expression ultimately of the Trinity. That's why this is in the way. Satan thinks by putting his little idol here, he can keep Jesus Christ from descending to the earth and assuming his rightful place as the top of the pyramid. And there's, there's, a, lot of, there's a lot of interesting stuff here. In the next couple of verses, he says, in verse 44 of Matthew 21, he says, Whosoever shall fall upon this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to a powder. Now what does that mean? Well, think about it. If you have a stone that's shaped like a pyramid, if you fall on it, you're going to break like that. If it falls on you, it's going to crush you to a powder. And I submit to you that what that is, is a, an image, a biblical typology of the first and second coming. Because the first time Jesus came that we might fall on him and be saved and be broken like we talked about earlier. The second time he's coming, if you aren't a member of his body, bam, you're going to be ground into the dust. No more Mr. Nice Guy, in other words. And that's what this symbol is, and that's why Satan is so desperate to keep this as his symbol, is because he does not want this pyramid completed. But we know that no matter what Satan does, it is going to be completed, because nothing can stay the hand of God. And that second advent, I believe, is very, very, very close. And on that note, I'm going to uh, bring it to a close for this portion. Thank you very much. Please keep your seat. Let me have some volume here. Thank you.
Before we, we get started on the next section, I just have a, a brief uh, statement of my own about our ministry. Um, with One Accord, which was just mentioned, is a ministry that's dedicated to spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ, especially to people that are trapped in cults and the occult. We do have a, a newsletter, and if any of you are interested in getting it, it is, there's no charge for it. I'm going to just uh, place this mailing list here. We'd appreciate it if you just pass it around and put your name and address on it legibly, and we'll try and get a newsletter out to you within a week or two. Thank you very much. Um, to return to our subject at hand, at this point, we've been talking about child abuse, the, the, the things that surround it, and, and why, the question is, why is Satan doing this? Well, the number one reason is Satan loves to defile innocence. And of course, a child is always innocent. And ever since the gentleman, I use the word very advisedly, that we talked about last time, Alistair Crowley began doing this, we have seen an explosion of the epidemic of child abuse. And there are other reasons for this. And I'm going to get into this briefly to just kind of finish up what we talked about in our last segment. Um, right now, the best guess we have is that one in four girls is a victim of incest or sexual abuse before they turn 18. One in five boys is similarly victimized. That means that there are about 40 or 50 million people in America that are survive, excuse me, survivors of sexual abuse. Now, there's a, there's a more sinister side of this, which can be either called satanic ritual abuse or Masonic ritual abuse. And about 1 in 20 victims of child abuse are victims of this kind of abuse. And that, of course, leads to there being 2 million such survivors. Uh, that's a lot of people. And what Satan's fondest dream is, is that these people will be impervious to this gospel message. He believes because of the way they have been treated, they will distrust God. They will believe that God hates them or that God doesn't care about them because he allowed these horrible things to be done to them. And, and it is only, I think, a testimony to the power of the saving message of Jesus Christ that, that many, many of these people have been saved, uh, many, many of them are living victorious lives in Jesus, and that is because of the liberating power of Jesus Christ. Now, here's what's ultimately happening. Um, we have found, we have prayed in our ministry for literally hundreds of such people, and, and usually nine times out of ten, they are completely set free by the blood of Jesus Christ. They don't need years of psychotherapy, they don't need hypnosis. They don't need all of these archaic things that, that seem to be a part of modern psychoanalysis. In fact, some of that, I believe, is counterproductive. Uh, but Satan believes that by doing this, he is, in fact, building an army for Armageddon. Satan has the, the belief, or at least this is what we were taught he believes when I was a Satanist, that if he can get enough people on his side, he can lick Jesus when Jesus comes back with his army for the battle of Armageddon. Now, that's rather fanciful if you really understand the Bible. Because, first of all, I think it's quite obvious that there probably will be more people on Satan's side than on Jesus' side. Because Jesus warns us that broad is the way to destruction and many there be that go thereat, and narrow is the way that leads to eternal life and few there be that go thereat. But it doesn't matter. Because the bottom line is, when we come back to earth with Jesus, we are just the cheering section, amen? He is coming back, and when that 200 million man army surrounds Jerusalem, he's going to come down and open up his mouth, and that two-edged sword is going to come out, and those 200 million soldiers are going to become crispy critters, just like that. And that, he doesn't need an army, because he is God Almighty. And so this is just another one of Satan's deceptions, whether he's self-deceived or whether he's just deceiving his followers, I don't know. But another thing I'm going to talk about very briefly is, is that some of this abuse has become very scientific, has become very much even funded, dare I say, by the scientific establishment within certain dark parts of our United States government. And that might shock some of you, but the fact of the matter is that ever since at least the 1940s, we have had an influx of scientific, and I use that word rather loosely, 
uh, researchers who have been studying the effects of torture and pain on children. And, and this has been funded by the Department of Defense and funded by the CIA as an effort to create super spies. Originally this was called MK Ultra, and um, it basically involved Dr. Joseph Mengele. How many of you have heard of him? The Angel of Death at Auschwitz. Over there he was torturing and experimenting on hundreds of children, working on cloning. <clears throat> working on, again, trying to figure out ways to create a super soldier, a super spy. And when he came over here, believe it or not, he was allowed to come to America under a thing called Operation Paperclip, along with hundreds of other Nazi scientists, both rocket scientists and medical scientists. The most famous rocket scientist would, of course, be Werner von Braun, who helped us with the, with the space program and, and probably made possible the moon landing. Um, but these people went up and, the, pardon me, Mengele and his crowd went up to Canada under the auspices of the government and started a group up there that came to be known as the MK Ultra Project. And there they took children out of Canadian orphanages, gave them a brand new drug at that time, which was called Lysergic Acid Diethylamide 25 LSD. They tortured them horribly and tried to turn them into super soldiers. The Canadian government finally found out about this and, and threatened to expose the whole thing and made them stop. They, they, they settled out of court, so to speak, for a huge sum of money, but it didn't stop. Even with the death of Mengele, it didn't stop. And, and even today, we have reason to believe that MK Ultra lives on in an over and more, even more heinous form as the Monarch Project. And the difference between the Monarch Project and the MK Ultra Project is that it fuses child abuse with Satanism. And what happens is, is that under the, again, the auspices of the government, uh, children not only tortured and drugged and electrocuted and having all sorts of horrible things done to them, but they are also hypnotized and have scientifically inserted demons placed within their, their altered parts, as they are called in what used to be called multiple personality disorder. It's now called dissociative identity disorder. And, and by doing that, they create various kinds of slaves, super spies, super sex slaves, super soldiers. And this is, this is a very dismaying part of what the government is doing, but this is one of the many black projects that is, it is unknown to most, probably 99% of the American people. And yet one of, the, one of the people involved in this is a gentleman, I use that word very advisedly, who is now, I believe, a general in the United States Army with the highest possible military clearance. He's, he's got a PhD in political science and his name is Michael Aquino. And he's the head of the Temple of Set, which is the second largest satanic organization in America. Now, Michael Aquino is a very interesting fellow. He's been charged three times with sexual abuse of children while he was at the Presidio out in San Francisco, but they could never make the charges stick. And I think part of the reason for that is because of some government involvement. But he, this is just to illustrate the strong connection, which I'm going to touch on later, between Nazi Germany and the occult. Um, both Anton LaVey and Michael Aquino are very fond of Nazism. They, because Hitler developed a huge um, magical system to help fuel his Third Reich. And if you get, and, and if you want proof of this, you can buy Anton LaVey's second, no, pardon me, his third book, The, Mas uh, the Masonic Rituals. <laughs> yeah, really. Actually, there are some Masonic rituals in there. No, it's called The Satanic Rituals. And in this book, there are two Nazi black magic rituals from the 1930s. And Aquino was very familiar with all this. And so when he was over in, in Europe, I believe this was in the early 80s. I have the exact date in one of my books. I don't have it in my memory. He went to Wewelsburg Castle. Now, if you ever heard of Wewelsburg Castle, it was the temple of the SS. It was like the spiritual heart of Nazism. And it was bombed by the Nazis toward the end of the war. And so it's just in ruins today. But the, this Aquino, this shows you the kind of mentality this guy has. He went there because he liked the vibes and he wanted to do an occult working there. And while he did this occult working, he claims he had a hierophany, an appearance of a god. 
And this God was this same extraterrestrial being named Ewas that appeared to Aleister Crowley in 1904. And according to Aquino, and he actually writes about this in his newsletter, it was like the mantle of Aleister Crowley. His authority was placed on Michael Aquino. And he is like the John the Baptist, if you will, for the coming Antichrist. And that is what he believes he is. And this is the man that's in charge of the program of tormenting all of these children. And today there seem to be, if our ministry is any uh, indication, there seem to be literally hundreds of people who are now in their 20s or 30s or even 40s who have been victimized by this monarch program. And again, the message I want to bring is one of hope because Jesus Christ can even set these people free. And, and we have dealt with people who have many, many older personalities who are, you know, one lady I can think of had 55 personalities and they all came together in three days by the power of Jesus Christ. Praise God. Because that kind of a woman would go through years of expensive psychotherapy. In fact, we know of one lady who spent $10,000 over a period of like a year on Christian psychotherapy, which to me is an oxymoron, um, and it actually ended up the worst for it. She was more messed up before than after. And it was a simple process to have her invite the Holy Spirit to come into her and straighten this mess out. Because it's so complicated, only Satan and, of course, a greater intellect than he, the Holy Spirit of God, could straighten this mess out. No therapist could. No psychological system could. These people are a rat's nest of demonic deception. And only the power of the Holy Spirit can do it. And that's why we just try and stand out of his way and let him work. Amen? You know, we don't have any real methodology. We just try and be open to the anointing and open to the power of the Holy Spirit. And many, many, many of these people have been set free. And I, I have a theory about those that aren't, and there are very few. But some of them actually like their condition. It gives them something in their lives to make them feel special. And we had a couple of people say, oh, I don't want to lose my altars. They're like family to me. And understand, these are entirely separate personalities, some of them with demonic roots. And yet they just did not want to let go of that. They, one lady said, oh, well, I was going to take my altars on a picnic next week. You know, hey, God is a gentleman. He's not going to force anybody. You know, and, and so all we can do is pray for those people that will come to a place where they're ready to surrender this stuff. Because that's often the way it is with people. They want to hold on to their pain because they don't trust God with that fragile thing of their pain. And that's really sad. But, um, you know, by the grace of God, we've still seen a lot of success with this. And um, just realize that this kind of stuff is going on and pray for our leaders. Pray for our government, even though I'm sure many of you don't really find them very respectful or, you know, worth praying for, that's all the more reason to pray for them. Because uh, it's biblical. Amen? Okay. So that's the monarch program. Now we're going to get into the second last part of this conspiracy, which is in a way the more modern, but in another way is actually very ancient. Uh, I spoke to you earlier about my involvement with UFOs as a teenager and my involvement as an, as, a, as an adult, many of the, of the milestones in my occult career were accompanied by UFO sightings. I've probably seen at least a dozen or more UFOs in my life, some of them very close. And now, all of a sudden, just in the last couple of years, we're seeing a new wave of media attention for the UFOs. We had one in the 50s where, um, you know, there were all these flying saucer movies, you know, flying saucers attack the earth, uh, the day the earth stood still, earth versus the flying saucers, and on and on and on. And, and now we're seeing another one. And, you know, we have TV shows like The X-Files and Dark Skies. We have, um, you know, movies like Independence Day or Species. What is Satan trying, because we know Satan owns the entertainment industry, amen? He's the prince of the power of the air. And so we have to ask, what is, what is he doing? What is the point of all this? And I believe that there's a very big point. I believe this is going to be a part of the great deception that is coming down on us 
as part of the end times. But I want to give you some background. Um, UFOs are not new. What many of you might not know is that they've been around centuries. They're even in the Bible. There's good and bad UFOs in the Bible. How many of you knew that? In fact, God has one heck of a UFO in Ezekiel 1. It's a living machine. Think of that. I mean, I know some of you think your cars are alive, you know. But this is a real living machine. It's a wheel within a wheel with eyes. And it says in the Word of God that that wheel has a spirit in it. That means, by biblical definition, it's alive. So that's one of God's UFOs. And there are others as well. And uh, if you're really interested, I suggest you check out the book, Space Invaders. Um, Columbus, on October 11, 1492, sighted a UFO leaving today what we call the Bermuda Triangle. John Wesley, the great evangelist, reported a UFO. He didn't call it that, of course, because that's a modern term but he saw a baffling, unexplained light in the sky. Now, let me just talk about that for a moment. We tend to view everything through the grid of our mindset. And because we live in a day of technology, a day of space travel and Star Trek and jet airlines flying across the Atlantic, when we see lights in the sky, we think that they're aircraft or spacecraft. But a hundred years ago, people thought such things were angels. Let me give you an example. 160 years ago or so, there was a farm boy named Joseph Smith, the founder of the Mormon Church. He supposedly, and we don't know if this story is even true, because Joseph Smith tended to lie his lips off a lot, but uh, supposedly he went out in the woods to pray, to find out what church to go to when he was a young adolescent. And, and as the story goes, all of a sudden he was, in this, he was in this grove of trees by himself, and all of a sudden he was enveloped with this overpowering darkness that rendered him numb and weak and powerless. And then all of a sudden, through the darkness, there broke a blinding beam of light from out of the sky. And in the center of this light, <sighs> floated down two personages of power and glory in white robes. And one of them said to the other, This is my beloved son, hear him. And the other one said, something to the effect that Joseph Smith should not join any church because they were all rotten to the core and that basically he should start his own. <laughs> and that was the genesis, supposedly, of the Mormon church. Now, of course, Mormons believe that was Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ. But a different age would have looked on that and said, Gee, that was a close encounter of the third kind. He saw aliens because it has all of the qualities of a UFO encounter, right down to the feelings of paralysis and weakness and darkness, followed by these beings appearing, godlike beings in white, glowing, silvery robes. Let me give you another example. 1917. Three farm children. In near the town of Fatima in Portugal saw a glowing sphere of light coming out of the heavens and inside of this sphere of light was a beautiful woman in white robes that glowed with the brightness of the sun. This woman later identified herself as the Mother of God, the Blessed Virgin Mary, and this became what we now know as Our Lady of Fatima. But what's interesting is, is that the, the entire thing sounds a whole lot like UFO encounters that we hear about all the time today. Again, close encounters of the third kind. What's especially suggestive about this is that there was one significant sign or wonder or miracle that surrounded this that was most noteworthy. And that is, on one particular day, this started to attract a lot of attention, as these things will. I'm sure a lot of you have seen media reports a few years ago about the Medjugorje apparitions over in, in what is now, I think, Bosnia or one of those countries. Um, but people tend to flock to these things because people are hungry for true spirituality. And when they see something miraculous, they think they're going to find it there. But in this case, there were like 10 or 20,000 people that had gathered because these apparitions have been going on for some time. And all of a sudden, they, they were told there was going to be a sign. And, of course, what does Jesus say? A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. 
But here's what happened. It was cloudy. It was rainy, or drizzly at least. And all of a sudden, the sun broke through the clouds and began to do barrel rolls and began to fly around the sky like it was being piloted by a demented screwball. It flew hither and yon, back and forth, to the amazement of the crowds. It was like watching the ultimate light show because this thing was as bright as the sun. They thought it was the sun, and to this very day, devout Catholics believe that God did that miracle, that he had the sun fly through the sky like, you know, some kind of idiot video game. Well, the problem with that theory is, I don't doubt for a minute God could do that. I mean, God, I mean, God did a pretty good trick with the sun for Joshua, amen? But the problem is, nobody else outside of Portugal saw this. I mean, you know, I would think if the sun was doing all this bizarre stuff, people would see it over in New York, or they'd see it in France, or they'd see it in Italy. But nobody outside of the immediate environs of the city of Fatima saw this. To me, that leaves a very obvious explanation. This was a UFO. It was a lying sign and wonder. And it has deceived millions, because millions of people still visit that shrine every year. And the Pope, as you may know, is very, very fond of it. Um, and, of course, there have been many such similar apparitions at Garabandal, at, at Lourdes, at, at Medjugorje, and there are others. There's even, an, there's even a Marian cult, that's what these are called, with full-blown Marian apparitions just a few hundred miles north of here in the seat of Wisconsin. I know, I used to be a part of it. Yeah. Not time to go into that one, I'm afraid. That's a whole other story. But anyway, see what the pattern is. God uses one, or not God, the devil uses wonders, uses signs, uses amazing things to deceive people. And now we're in an age where we look at things like that and we think nuts and bolts. We think technology. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, maybe it's something more. Okay, let's look at what's going on here. I've already mentioned our old friend, I'll put his ugly puss up here again. Alistair Crowley. Now, this guy, I mean, this guy has his handprint on everything evil that happened, it seems that it happened in, in this century. In fact, he even take, took the credit for creating Adolf Hitler, believe it or not. Of course, the guy obviously had a little bit of an ego problem. In fact, he once made the statement that the highest spiritual experience any woman, he didn't think much of women, uh, could ever experience was having sex with Alistair Crowley. So, the guy obviously, you know, had a lot of self-esteem. I mean, our psychologist today would really love him. Anyway, he began having communications with extraterrestrial beings. That was his word. With this EWAS back in 1904. What's interesting is that just three years after that, in 1907, was the, one of the most spectacular close encounters that we ever have known about with a UFO, and that was in Tunguska, Siberia. Something. We don't know what it was, because nobody actually saw this. As you probably know, Siberia is not very well populated. But something came down out of the sky and exploded over this isolated part of Siberia with a force greater than many, many megatons. And this was, of course, 40 years before the invention of the, H, of the A bomb, or the H bomb. And it was so powerful it flattened trees for 10 miles in every direction. And it left a residue of nuclear radiation, which is so powerful, it killed everything within 150 miles. Now, most meteors, and of course some of you may have even seen that dippy thing they had on TV a few weeks ago, the asteroid thing. And, and we understand that an asteroid can hit with an incredible amount of force. But they don't usually leave nuclear radiation residue, unless it's a radioactive ice, a asteroid. And so some people have thought that this was a UFO that crashed in Siberia. The next thing that happened was that Crowley had a contact with another extraterrestrial that identified itself as Lam. That was the, guy, the little guy's name. He was short, and he let Crowley draw a picture of him. And oddly enough, this is very much what the picture looked like. This is the classical modern UFO. This is from a very popular book on alien abductions by a, a horror writer named Whitley Stryber, except this story is supposedly true, as it says there. He claims that he is an alien abductee. Uh, anyhow, 
it's interesting that like you know 40 years before we knew such aliens existed that Aleister Crowley was having conversations with them and drawing pictures of them uh, this man developed a whole system of magic which has come to be called trans magic I mentioned that before and and a lot of stuff was written about it from the context of a of a contemporary of Crowley's who was a, a pretty well-known horror writer nowadays he wasn't well known back then named Howard Phillips Lovecraft HP Lovecraft for short and Lovecraft wrote all of these books like the Dunwich Horror the shadow out of time the color out of space the shadow over Innsmouth and these were very different kind of horror novels and they're not like Stephen King because these were written in a more gentle time and they were very genteel horror novels if you, it sounds like a contradiction in terms but but they were horror novels with a science fiction twist they were about aliens from outer space that came here that were incredibly malignant incredibly powerful and their appearance was such that if a man would even look at one for an instant it would drive him hopelessly insane forever and these were called the great old ones and these beings could be accessed through forbidden books like the Necronomicon a lot of people thought the Necronomicon was fictional it isn't in fact today you can buy a book in any Walden bookstore that has about half the Necronomicon in it and it's a very very dangerous book um, a lot of people think Lovecraft just made this stuff up but there's a lot of evidence that his grandfather was involved in Egyptian Freemasonry and so he had access to this and whether he himself was a magician or whether he was just writing about this stuff to sort of exorcise his personal demons we don't know but we do know that Lovecraft was a very weird individual he, had, he never married most of his life he lived with two maiden aunts he would never go underground he feared the subways he would never go within the sight of the ocean he feared the ocean uh, he had correspondences with many of the other great horror and science fiction writers of his day but I don't believe he ever actually traveled and met any of them and he died more or less a lonely only moderately successful writer because he really didn't get really popular until in the 1960s and he's been dead now for many years but the interesting thing is many many pardon me many occult writers that are experts on Crowley and his philosophies and teachings have noted that there's some exact correspondences between these fictitious supposed monsters and Crowley's real gods and the important thing I want you to get from this little mini discussion is that these are aliens that are worshipped as gods these are aliens that are supposedly so ancient that they were old when Jehovah was in knee pants that's the word of one occult writer and so these are incredibly powerful incredibly ancient gods that come here one of them is slumbering in the Pacific Ocean his name is Kluhu um, and, and interestingly enough one of the books and this will really tickle you I think one of his most famous books was called the shadow over Innsmouth and it was about uh, how a little New England city on the coast of the Atlantic had frog-like beings coming out of the ocean and having sex with mortal women in Masonic lodges in the town and producing Batrachian offspring, frog-like offspring that would be amphibious, intelligent, humanoid life forms. Kind of strange, huh? Another one of his books, The Dunwich Whore, involved a ritual in which a human woman ha was forced in a ritual to have sex with a powerful alien being and produced a monster, a half human, half something else, that was so horrible that it drove men mad. And, and this is very much the stuff of modern UFO abduction, from the miscegenation from the idea of interbreeding angels and humans or aliens and humans 
from the idea of, uh, of people coming out of the water or people coming up from under the earth and doing this because as I think many of you know if you'd studied UFOs is a lot of them seem to come out of the ocean and a lot of them seem to come out of the earth. There's been a lot of discussion and I believe there that these stories are absolutely true from my resources and my involvement in this prior to being saved that there are huge underground bases in the west especially the southwest, Arizona, New Mexico, Utah and so on where some of these things are stored. So maybe Lovecraft had a lot to be afraid of when he went underground. Maybe he had a lot to be afraid of when he looked at the ocean. But we don't have anything to be afraid of because we are bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. Okay. Anyway, the next thing that happens in our little chronology is that there seems to have been an involvement with the Nazis in all this. The Nazis, as I already mentioned, were deeply involved in the occult. And Hitler had channelers who were working and received communications from extraterrestrial beings, supposedly at least, to build a UFO. And they called these UFOs flugelrods. <laughs> That's the German word for flying wheel. And, and there are actually blueprints of these that are now available. Uh, and uh, it's interesting, if any of you were old enough to be involved in World War II in the European theater of operations, especially in the Air Force, you know there were such things as, as Foo Fighters. That's what they were called. They were mysterious lights that buzzed the aircraft. And the Allies thought they were German secret weapons, and the Luftwaffe thought they were American secret weapons. <laughs> and nobody really knew what they were. Perhaps they were flugelrods. Anyway, Hitler, and, and let me just remind you of something. Nazi Germany produced some pretty phenomenal occult, uh, not occult, but technological achievements. I mean, look at the V-2 rocket. Look at, the, uh, look at the fact that they produced a jet engine in the late, pardon me, in the latter part of World War II, which was better than any jet engine that we produced a decade and a half later. They were that far away from creating the, their own atomic bomb. Fortunately, we got there first on that one. But where did they get all this technology? I mean, I'm part German. I know Germans are smart, amen, but I don't believe they're that smart. <laughs> and I think they had some demonic help because Satan has forgotten more than any human being knows about physics or aeronautics. He is the prince of the power of the air, after all. So anyway... Toward the end of the war, Hitler began to realize he was losing and he didn't want to lose these precious little devices. And so, and I've got to explain something here. Hitler basically believed in his own kind of twisted form of theosophy. That was his doctrine. And one of the things that he believed is that the earth was hollow because that's part of the occult doctrine. He believed that if you went in through a special hole, either in the North Pole or the South Pole, that there would be a whole other world inside of the earth with the sun in the center and people walking around upside down on the inside of it. They, they would be like this in comparison to us, okay? If you believe this, I have a bridge in Brooklyn to sell you. Uh, anyway, but he really believed this and he made policy in accord with this. I mean, nobody said Hitler was sane, amen? Anyway, so he thought what he would do is sail some of these flugel rods down to the South Pole and hide them underneath the earth in this lost civilization until a later time when they could come forth and help build the Fourth Reich. So he, he sent a Nazi flotilla down there and Admiral Byrd intercepted him on orders from the United States government. Now, this is a battle which never made it into the history books, needless to say. You don't read about this in school. But we found out about it because uh, one of Admiral Byrd's relatives came upon some of his father's diaries and notes. And there was a pitched battle off the coast of Antarctica. And we don't know whether, whether Hitler got some of these things hidden or whether we captured them. That much is not known. But what is known is that at the end of World War II, all of a sudden, we began to appear to have access to alien technology. In 1947, the year, interestingly enough, of Crowley's death, 
a spacecraft supposedly crashed near Roswell, New Mexico, near the Roswell Army Airfield, which was the site of the 509th Strategic Bomb Wing. That was at that time the only bomb wing in the world that had atomic bombs. And this, whatever it was, crashed out in the desert on a deserted ranch near this uh, army base. And at first the army claimed that it had retrieved the wreckage and that it was a flying disc. That was what they said. But the next day they changed their story and said, oops, it was a weather balloon. And um, the guy that actually helped found it was uh, Colonel Jesse Marcel, and he maintained to his death that he had seen parts of this that were totally inhuman, that represented a technology unlike anything he had ever seen on Earth, and they certainly were not a weather balloon. Um, supposedly, at this time, they retrieved bodies from this wreckage. Some of them were dead, and at least one of them was alive. And this is a, a, a drawing of a, of, of a sketched enhancement of a long-range telephoto photograph of an alien being escorted by two military policemen. And you'll notice that he's short and that he's got some kind of a breathing apparatus on. And uh, this, this little guy was named E.B., which stood for Extra Biological Entity. And uh, supposedly he lived for several years and finally died and they couldn't figure out what to do with him because his physiology was so different. Um, the next thing that happened is they began to realize, the government meaning, that this was a significant situation because they had had some encounters with these things in the air and they had found that they could outfly us, they could outshoot us, they could outrun us. In fact, one person, Captain Thomas Mantell, was killed flying an F-51 Mustang uh, when he tried to follow uh, one of these UFOs up to 25,000 feet. And the thing was going faster than any aircraft known to man. And it was huge, according to his own, his words. The last words he said were, the thing looks metallic and is tremendous in size. His plane crashed for unknown reasons and the wreckage covered nearly a square mile. The Air Force explanation he sighted a skyhook balloon, weather balloon. What happened then is that the government set up a special commission that was called Majesty 12 or MJ-12 for short. And a special high-level clearance was created for this called MAGIC, M-A-J-I-C. And any UFO reports were to be funneled through this and given a cover-up story. And it was decided that the American people weren't ready for this, that there would be worldwide panic, that it would destroy the foundations of our culture and our religions, and so we're going to lie to the American people and indeed to the people of the world. One person, however, disagreed with this idea on the panel. He was Admiral Forrestal. Some of you may have heard of him. A uh, great naval hero. And uh, what happened was, is he said he thought the American people were ready for this, and he was going to go public with it. Because of that, he was immediately confined to Bethesda Naval Hospital, and after his family started to try and get him released, he was suicided, or as we now say, arkansized, by flying out the window of his hospital room with a sheet around his neck, and he fell three stories and broke his neck. So this is dangerous stuff. This is deadly stuff. Uh, and at this point, they began to work on this project of misinformation. What seems to have happened next is that in the mid-50s, a treaty was allegedly entered into between the United States government, President Eisenhower, and the UFO people. They signed a treaty, and this was the terms of the treaty that the United States would be gradually given UFO technology. In exchange for this, the UFO people would be given the right to prey upon the American people, abduct us, experiment on us, and then put us back, as long as they didn't kill anybody. What a deal, huh? So after that, many, many sightings continued to happen, and, and the craft were coming in all kinds of shapes and sizes. I mean, this is a, a kind of a collage of what these UFOs were looking like. 
And, and some of them were quite extraordinary sightings. At one point, there were hundreds of them flying over the Capitol. They were simultaneously sighted by aircraft, land observers, and radar. Now, that's pretty hard to do unless you're looking at something that's real. Um, also, at one point, astronomers at Mount Palomar, which is one of the most celebrated telescopes, I think it's the world's largest reflecting telescope out in California, saw more than a thousand UFOs fly over the moon and they picked them up on the telescope. Uh, there have literally been sightings by m literally hundreds of trained observers, pilots, uh, military pilots, astronomers, you name it, people that ought to know what's going on up in the sky. Now, remember about this treaty. As a result of this treaty, we began to have a new kind of close encounter. For your information, there's, there's now four kinds that have been classified. Dr. J. Allen Hynek, who was an astronomer from Northwestern University, and he was asked by the Air Force to run their Project Blue Book, which was their little cover-up thing for many years. He came up with the first three. Close encounter of the first kind was seeing a UFO up close in the sky. Close encounter of the second kind was if the UFO landed and produce some kind of physical evidence of its being there. In other words, burn marks on the ground, like maybe the prints of a landing gear, or perhaps some radio radioactive residue. Close encounter of the third kind is when the UFO lands and you see or communicate with an alien. And close encounter of the fourth kind is what we're now going to talk about. The first time that this happened, that we know of, was in 1961, interestingly enough, just a few years after the, um, the treaty supposedly took place. This was a couple named Betty and Barney Hill, and um, they were driving through the deserted highways of New Hampshire late at night, and they lost four or five hours of time. At the time, they were just bewildered by it. They'd seen some lights in the sky, but they didn't think much of it. But afterwards, they began to have a lot of, of emotional problems, nightmares. They went to a therapist. They were hypnotized, which we don't recommend, by the way. But as a result of that, they had memories of being taken aboard this craft and having all sorts of invasive medical procedures done to them. Uh, this caused a sensation. They wrote a book called Interrupted Journey, which you see here, and, and it was a bestseller. And it, it created a whole new genre, if you will, of UFO activity. Since that time, thousands and thousands of people report being abducted. Now, some of them are copycats, some of them are Fruit Loops, clinically speaking. Uh, some of them are genuine. And this is a very disturbing phenomenon, which I believe the church cannot and must not ignore. Um, the interesting thing about this encounter, which lent it some validity, is that this woman, while she was on the craft under hypnosis, she reported seeing a star chart. She drew this chart, star chart, and it was told to her by the aliens that this is their home star system, Zeta Reticuli. Now that's a real star system. And the trouble is it didn't look right. And so the experts just sort of went, ha ha, you know, and they poo pooed it. But just in very recent years, we've had the computer ability to take star systems and three-dimensionally move them around to see what they look like from other directions. And what some enterprising individual discovered is that that would be what the Zeta Reticuli star system looked like if, in fact, it was viewed from that planet and not from Earth. Now, how do you explain that? Two explanations are possible. One is she was really on board an alien craft. The other is she got the image from a demon, because demons do a lot of traveling. So what's going on with these? Well, real briefly, people seem to be accosted by a UFO in a fairly isolated setting. They are somehow tranquilized. They're unable to move. They're rendered submissive, and they're taken aboard a ship, often through a levitation beam. The, 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 sh the people on board the ship usually are described as looking like the alien that I just showed you. They're very short, three to four feet tall, big heads, huge eyes, 
no genitals, vestigial mouth and nose and ears, in other words, not very much of those in evidence, and they stink. They smell like sulfur. Interesting smell. Uh, anyway, blood and other bodily fluids are usually extracted from the human people. Uh, by weird devices. There's a lot of interest in the person's reproductive system. Uh, quite often, these things are taken, sperm or ova, are taken from the person, and um, then they are let back to where they are. They are returned to where they were found, sometimes hours later, sometimes even days later. And the problem with this also is that sometimes women get pregnant as a result of these encounters. Sometimes the babies vanish. Sometimes they're carried to term and then they're whisked away by doctors and the woman is never allowed to see them. And um, the end result is that uh, they um, are told that it's stillborn. These women often have dreams later on in which they are taken aboard the ship and see their child, and it's an alien-human hybrid. So, sometimes these people, after they are returned, if they start telling stories about what has happened to them, they are hassled by the dreaded MIBs, the men in black. These are men that are dressed entirely in black. They often look Asian in appearance. They drive outdated black Cadillacs in perfect condition. They talk in a metallic monotone, and they threaten these people with various forms of harm and even death if they continue to speak. Okay. Now, the other thing you need to know is that essentially there's three kinds of these aliens reported. There's the grays, which are the little guys that I showed you the picture of. There's the Nordics. And these are the ones that look like us, except better. <laughs> They're beautiful, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, god or goddess-like figures with incredibly perfect builds. And they look totally human, except maybe they look a little too good to be true, except for the fact that they are seen in the company of the greys or other aliens on board UFOs, which makes them seem weird. The third kind, which are the more disturbing kind, are what are called the Reptoids, or the Draconians. These supposedly come from the star constellation Draco, which oddly enough means dragon in Latin. And um, they look like reptiles. They look like humanoid reptiles. They're six to seven feet tall with alligator-like heads. And they apparently are said to have the ability to, ship, to shape shift. That's hard to say. Uh, and appear to be human for brief periods of time, except that their eyes still look reptilian. And these have been sighted frequently in shopping malls below Salt Lake City, for some strange reason, by the cleaning people. You see a lot of strange things below Salt Lake City. Let me tell you, I've been there. I mean below, not just on the surface. Because I don't know if many, many of you know this, but there's, there's eight stories worth of, of building and tunnels beneath the Salt Lake Temple in Temple Square. And there's a lot of unseen stuff going on down there. And I want to be a bit surprised that they had a few lizards running around the size of, you know, a human being. Anyway, what does all this have to do with the end time scenario? Well, let's look at what the Bible has to say about all this. We do understand that there are, in fact, UFOs in the Bible. I've already mentioned that. The Bible does not really talk about if or whether or not there are alien beings, people from other planets. I personally don't think these are from other planets. I think they're not extraterrestrials. I think they're infraterrestrials. What I mean by that is that they don't come from up there. They come from down here, way down here. Okay. There's seven different types of beings found in the Bible. There's God, higher spirit beings, Angels, humans, the mysterious giants called Nephilim in the Hebrew, demons, and animals. Now what's interesting about all of this is that if you go back to the Bible, Jesus gives us a very clear warning about what's going on here. In Matthew 24, he says this. He says, as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Now, what was the most prominent sin mentioned in the Bible in the days of Noah? 
besides the fact that nobody believed Noah, <laughs> which was obviously unbelief. The sin was in Genesis 6, and it was that the sons of God came down from heaven and had sexual relations with human women to produce offspring that were either mighty men, demigods, or monsters. Now, if that was going on in the days of Noah, according to Jesus, it's going to be going on today. Except that instead of we're us thinking that they're fallen angels, now we think they're aliens. And the end result is still the same. The corruption of the human race. Now, before the flood, Satan had one aim in mind. He was trying to defile the bloodline of humanity to keep God from producing the promised Messiah from Genesis 3. However, that's no longer an issue. There's nothing he can do about it because Jesus Christ came, did the job God sent him to do, and came, went up to heaven in glory. So what's going on now? Some people would say, in fact, that there is no, pre there's no reason to believe that angels are still coming down and having sex with women. Well, let me explain why I believe that's true. First of all, there are giants mentioned after the flood. Where'd they come from? These are not normal giants, mind you. These are big. I mean, look at Goliath. He was something like eight or nine feet tall. And he had a whole family. <laughs> you know, there were whole races of giants. The Anakim, the Rephaim, stuff like that. So, oh, okay. <laughs> so anyway, uh, it's important to understand that that this stuff was going on after the flood. Now, further, and this is very important, Paul gives us a very interesting warning in 1 Corinthians 11. He tells us there that a woman should have power over her head for the sake of the angels. Now, what does that mean? It's kind of weird. <laughs> well, the passage in context is talking about a woman having her head covered. I don't believe that literally means that women have to wear veils or hats or whatever in church. There are some Christians who believe that, and that's fine with them. I believe it's a spiritual concern. It's a concern for headship. I believe that because women, and sorry ladies, but this is what the Bible says, women are the weaker vessel. They have sensitivities that men do not have. They're very spiritually sensitive. Men tend to be spiritual lunkheads, by and large. I can say that I'm a man. Amen. So how many women want to say amen to that? Anyway, <laughs> uh, the point is, is that, is that women need to have a headship covering. If they're married, it's their husband. Hopefully, if he's saved. If he's not, then unfortunately, it's negative headship. Failing that, a woman needs to have the headship covering of a pastor because they shouldn't be out there alone. And what Paul is saying here is that there's something beguiling about a woman. Angels find you hot little numbers. And Satan is there whispering in the, the angel's ears telling him, go ahead, go ahead, ask her out for a date. <laughs> uh, it's not usually quite that much fun. As you can see, this is horrible stuff that is being done to these women, and it's not new. Down through history, there have been constant legends, not just in the Bible, of, of gods coming down and raping human women. Leda and the Swan, which produced Helen of Troy, an extraordinarily beautiful woman. Europa and the Bull, that was Zeus taking the form of a bull and raping a woman named Europa. The result was the Minotaur, a monster that was half bull and half man. While we're on the subject of that, let me just briefly point out that Satan's natural appearance, remember this, he's a cherub. What does a cherub look like? The Bible says Satan can appear as an angel of light, but he is not an angel. He is a fallen cherub. See Ezekiel 28 if you don't believe me. And according to Ezekiel 1 and 13, a cherub is a winged bull with human hands in its natural state. So we can truthfully say that Satan is a lot of bull. Now think about this. We have all this folklore about Satan having horns, about Satan having cloven hooves, about Satan having wings. 
Think about why did, why did Aaron build a golden calf? Why did the apostate kings of Israel build golden calves to worship? Why does every culture have sacred cows? You've got the cow, the Brahma bulls in India. You've got the Serapis, the bull god of, um, of Egypt. And almost every culture has sacred bulls or sacred cows in them. There's a reason for this. And I think it's important that we understand that. We've got to know the enemy in order to be able to better fight him. Now, let's talk about what's happening here. The sons of God came down and had relations with the daughters of men. The thing we understand, though, from the New Testament is that angels in their natural condition cannot procreate with humans. See Matthew 22, 30. Angels have glorified human-like bodies of flesh and bone without blood, just as we will have one day. See 1 Corinthians 15.50 and Ephesians 6.12. No blood in those bodies. I personally believe that Adam and Eve may not originally have had blood in their veins. Think of what, what Adam said in Genesis 2.23. He looked at Eve and he said, She is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Nothing about blood. When they ate of the fruit, which was probably a kind of grape, see Deuteronomy 32.14, they got the blood in their veins that was to be their mortality and to be their undoing. This transformation of whatever else was in their veins before into blood is alluded to by several key miracles in the Bible. One of them is the fact that the first public miracle of Moses was turning water into blood the Nile River. The first public miracle of Jesus was turning water into wine. Interesting. Something's going on here. Now what I learned from my time in the Brotherhood is that in order for an angel to be able to function sexually they must drink human blood. And at that moment they fall because that's a very, very grave sin. It's the, one of the few sins that is forbidden in all the dispensations of the Bible right up to the church age. Read Acts 15 if you don't believe me. Christians are not supposed to drink blood. Now, <clears throat> when they fell, they would lose all their angelic power. They would lose all their angelic intellect. Not all of it, though. It would become twisted. It would become vile. It would become evil. What else would happen is God is the source of all beauty. God is the source of all glory. And when they cut themselves off from God, they would begin to lose the beauty that was theirs by virtue of their angelic station. They kept not, as the Bible says, their first estate. And so they would gradually begin to deteriorate and become twisted and evil-looking. Now their children would be supermen, men of renown. This is where we get the legends of beings like Hercules, the best known demigod who even has his own TV series now. He was half God and half man. And there's many heroes like him throughout the world. In fact, many people incorrectly say that Jesus is such a being. That's not true. Jesus is all God and all man. Amen? Amen. Only he could manage that one. Now. These fallen angels are still around today using their intellects to make up for their la loss of angelic power. And they have created the technologies with the help of their master Satan that we see before us in these UFOs. They are still driven by Satan to interbreed with human beings. And they have used their technology to blackmail the U.S. government to allow them to misuse U.S. citizens as they see fit. Now their hope is to produce a child that would be the Antichrist. And that's what they had been working on for many, many years. I now believe that they have achieved that. I think they achieved that in 1966. That was what I was told. I don't know that to be true. Um, as a result of that, nowadays their plan is something else. They're trying to co-opt as many human beings as they can. Because according to, John, I don't know if you've heard of Dr. John Mack, but he's a very well-known Harvard psychiatrist who has done some very serious studies 
in the field of alien abductions. He now believes that there are between four and five million American citizens that have had this kind of experience, or at least believe they have. And he says that many of these people have come to love the aliens that have kidnapped them and raped them. Many of these Americans have come to covet the aliens' attentions. It makes them feel special. A lot of these people claim they have a dual consciousness, which is half alien and half human. They feel as if they are possessed by a superhuman alien intelligence. Now, see how subtle that is. Remember, Satan is very subtle. Most people, even if they weren't Christians or even if they weren't churched people at all, if you went up to them and said, hey, how'd you like to have a demon in you? They'd probably say, no thanks, I'll pass. <laughs> but if you came up to someone and said, how'd you like to have an infinitely wise alien intelligence within you? A lot of people would say, yeah, that'd be cool. I think of Mr. Spock or something, you know. Anyhow, and of course the media is doing everything it can to play this stuff up. So as a result, we are seeing more and more people being deceived. And this has turned into a full-blown cult. You can literally be, it can literally be said that there is a flying saucer cult out there, just like there's a New Age cult. Now, the two overlap a lot, because you've got to look at what the Space Brothers, quote-unquote, are saying. The gospel that they are preaching is the same gospel that the New Agers are preaching. Love the earth, hug the trees, be nice to the dolphins, Jesus is just an ascended master, you know, this kind of dreck. And it just goes on and on and on. They don't preach the true gospel. Therefore, they are not servants of the true and living God. Amen? But yet people are believing this thing. They are looking to the stars for their salvation instead of looking to Jesus Christ. And I think this is going to be very much part of the end times deception. Now, what we have as a result is it's very possible we're going to see Jesus coming down in a UFO with holes in his hands and feet in just the right places and people are going to be very deceived. I know that there are many, many people that have different theories about this. And I, I you know, in fact I was talking with Norm Franz about this some weeks ago and I, I think he has a very good insight on that. I was talking with Phil on the way there and he says, well how would they do something like this? He, uh, Brother Norm has talked about how they could create a false rapture with UFO technology. And I says, we can do that right now. These people, many of them have implants, just like are placed in many Satanist abuse victims. What if these implants, now this is just my little theory, what if they were miniature neutron bombs? And you know what a neutron bomb does? It burns and vaporizes living human flesh, but leaves behind inorganic matter. And if these people, there's thousands of them, maybe even millions, walking around with these things, if they were all detonated by a signal from space, <laughs> like that, there'd be nothing left but clothing. And that's what Christians expect from the rapture, isn't it? And what would happen, and I mean, that's just assuming the technology that I know about. I know that if we know about neutron bombs, there's what I call black science out there, just like there's black magic, and I don't mean that as a racial term, but there's unknown science that we are being kept with, like this cloning thing. I mean, ooh, we can clone a sheep. Isn't that interesting? You know, the Lamb of God, and they're talking about cloning a sheep. I find that very interesting. Um, they've been cloning since the 1940s, for heaven's sakes. It's just that now they're finally admitting it. And that's the way with a lot of this stuff. So I think it's entirely possible they could find a way to either beam up or vaporize hundreds of thousands or maybe millions of people that are alien abductees and all of a sudden Christians would be thinking, did I miss the rapture? <laughs> you know, what's going on here? I mean, and I, I think that's a, uh, a real, real possibility. And, and anyway, it doesn't matter because these people are looking to the wrong place for their salvation. And, and, of course, other authors have talked about how the UFO phenomenon could be used as an explanation for the real rapture. Because if all of a sudden millions and millions of Christians vanish from the earth, 
How are they going to explain that? Maybe they're going to be carried off by the UFOs. In fact, when I was in, I forgot to mention one of my cults, <coughs> I was in Elizabeth Clare Prophet's Church Universal and Triumphant, and they teach that us evil, bigoted, narrow-minded, fundamentalist whatevers, <laughs> that we are going to be taken off the planet at some point, and we're going to be taken to the star system Sirius instantaneously to be purified in the violet flame until we've learned the error of our ways and have become more politically correct. So this is already built into New Age doctrine. And it would be a very easy way to explain the rapture, the real one. So this is really rich in possibilities for the devil. And that's why I believe he's spending so much time on it. Because he knows people now are desperate. He knows people now are looking for something because they know the world is in trouble they know that the economy is in trouble they know that, that the environment is threatened and they're looking anywhere except the right place they're not looking in this book amen they, they would rather look to some slimy little gray guy you know than look to Jesus Christ because that's the that's the whole thing of human ego and human hubris the fact that, that because Jesus offers them something for free and something that demands that they admit that they are a sinner they don't want to do that so they'll take this nice warm fuzzy space gospel which tickles the human ego so we see a lot of this stuff going on and I think we need to be prepared to talk to our friends that might be taken up with this and to realize that, that I, I do believe there is a genuine nuts and bolts technology up there I think some of it may be pure demonic hallucination, and I think some of it may be holographic projections, but I think some of it is genuine nuts and bolts technology that was created by satanic intellects or by humans that were fed the information by satanic intellects. Speaking of satanic intellects, <laughs> I'm going to get into the last part of our presentation now, and this involves what I believe to be one of the more dangerous aspects of this conspiracy from a purely spiritual perspective. From some of this that we've talked about has been pretty awful. And it seems very terrifying, but, but in a way what I'm about to say, although it will seem more physically harmless, it's actually more dangerous spiritually. And I think you'll see what I mean. Satan is assaulting the church like never before. We see spiritual leaders falling. We see a rise in divorce among Christian leaders. We see false doctrines spreading through the church like wildfire, like leaven, if you will. Why is this happening? Well, I believe that what Satan has been trying to do is steal the weapons of our warfare. And in order to do that, he has to take away our one offensive weapon. And that, of course, is the sword of the Spirit. A key issue in all the talk and writing about spiritual warfare, and believe me, I have read probably every book, and I've even written one, about spiritual warfare that's out there. And most Christians understand that they have authority over the demonic realm. They understand that they have authority over the lying and deceitful spirits that plague us from all sides. However, what does this really mean in context? What does this mean in practice? Where do they get their authority? And that's an important question. Um, because you see, that's what Satan is going to ask you. Otherwise, you're going to end up like the Jewish exorcists. And they said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who the heck are you? Now, contrary to popular belief, an antichrist is not someone who is apparently against Christ. An antichrist is a substitute Christ. In 1 John 2.22 2, and 23 we read, Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father, but he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. And this is an even more important passage. In 1 John 4, 1 to 3, John tells us a very important thing. Beloved, try not ev believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. 
Hereby know ye, that ye know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God, and this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Now, that's exactly the problem with the space aliens and their gospel. They do not confess that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Jesus warned of false Christ in Matthew 24, 24 as did Paul in 2 Corinthians 11.4. He said, For if he that cometh preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might bear well with him. Indeed, the whole essence of all of these cults, especially the Mormons, the Jehovah Witnesses, the New Agers, and so on, is that they offer a nearly perfect counterfeit of Jesus Christ. Part of the reason the church of Jesus Christ, the true church, has been so reluctant to confront these spiritual warfare issues head on. And let me tell you, that's really true. I talked to so many pastors that I think they've got lace in their underwear. I mean, they are scared to death of this stuff. I mean, we out west especially, I mean, I think we've got more people with guts around here, but... You know, out west we would have hundreds of people coming to us and they would say, their pastors are afraid of me. Their pastors are afraid of demons. Their pastors don't know what to do with the devil or else they don't believe the devil exists. What the heck is going on here? Well, I believe that the spiritual warfare issues that were involved have become as big as they have because the, the leadership of our churches has been allowed themselves to be defanged declawed, or dare I say it, spiritually gelded by an antichrist spirit which has pervaded the highest levels of Christian pulpits and academia. Thus the issue of spiritual authority involves how to take back that ground that Satan has gained. We have some Christian churches that have removed or want to throw out onward Christian soldiers because it's too militant. Or they don't want to have power in the blood in the hymnal anymore because it's slaughterhouse religion. We can nod our heads and smile and we can say, oh, we'd never fall for that. I mean, you know, we're too tough for that. We'd never fall for that one. But yet we are told we are being sold today an infinitely smoother con job and we've become very nice, soft, sleepy Christians. Billy Sunday once said, and he was a famous evangelist from the early part of this century, he said that he thought that blood would run in the streets of America before prayer would be taken out of our school system. It happened 40 years later, and not a drop of blood was shed over it. I want you to remember this quote. Romans 3, 4, Let God be true, but every man a liar. The conspiracy strikes at the heart of the church. And I'm going to share with you a brief study now on religious castration. Remember what the criteria were in 1 John. A denial of Jesus as God come in the flesh or a denial of the Father and the Son. Most Christians understand the necessity of renouncing or shutting doorways for satanic access into the lives of cultists. We have, we've already know about false scriptures like the New World Translation or the Book of Mormon. But how about, for example, a set of scriptures that denies the virgin birth? That's Luke 2.33 in the NIV. And then that's the same passage in the King James Version. Notice the difference. Luke 2.33 identifies Jesus as Joseph as Jesus' father which he was not. How about a passage like this? Here you see that Jesus is called a holy servant. Here you see he's called a holy child. Now, that's not real bad, but it, we're all servants of God. Jesus is something very unique. Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. Which term, by the way, is totally removed from the NIV Bible. Nowhere in the NIV Bible is Jesus called the only begotten. How about this one? This verse is totally missing from all the modern Bibles, or else it's been reduced to a footnote. 
That's the best verse in the entire Bible to use against the Jehovah Witness. And it's been removed. When you fight against a Jehovah Witness with an NIV Bible, it's like using a machine gun where half your bullets are blanks. Now, we talk about the blood of Jesus. In the NIV, it says, In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Duh. What's missing? In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. That's a pretty important thing to say there. Amen. But you see, we don't want to have any slaughterhouse religion now, do we, friends? Okay. Then we've got a very important passage. Without controversy, the King James says, Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in the, received up in the glory. Now notice this. Up here it says, He appeared in a body. Gee, that's real helpful. I appeared in a body. You appeared in a body. Everybody in here appeared in a body. Big deal. Now what did it say? It says, anyone who denies that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is the spirit of Antichrist. They're denying it here. Now you know what they're going to say? They're going to say, oh, well, that doctrine appears somewhere else in the NIV. And they're right, it does. But why are they doing this? You know what I say? I say that if, if they steal this here and they leave it in somewhere else, that's like a thief that steals your wallet, that steals your clothes, and wants applause because he left you your socks. What does it say in Jeremiah about people that steal God's words? Now look at the very passage that we just talked about. Look at the difference here. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus has come in the flesh. Jesus hasn't just has come in the flesh. He is come in the flesh because he still has a glorified body of flesh and bone. Amen? So that doesn't help much. Any New Age Twinkie will acknowledge that Jesus has come in the flesh. They've got his picture. I've been in many spiritualist churches and many New Age churches, and they all have pictures of Jesus around. He's a great ascended master. Don't you know that? Then, look at this. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. Well, that doesn't help at all. Because every New Ager that I know of on the face of the earth acknowledges Jesus. They don't acknowledge that he is God come in the flesh. But they acknowledge him. If you go to church, universal and triumphant, Elizabeth Clare Prophet's cult, you'll see enormous pictures of Jesus everywhere. They acknowledge him. They just don't believe he's still come in the flesh. They think he's off, off, the, uh, off the earth plane or something. So they've, they've struck right at the heart of the verse that we are supposed to use to discern spirits. Now many of you are probably a little bit shocked by this, although many of you may already know about this issue. This is something which people say, oh, you're dividing the church over trivial issues. Well, first of all, we didn't fire the first shot. The devil did. The King James Bible has been around for 400 years, and it's produced more revivals, more blood-bought souls, than any other Bi all the other Bibles put together down through the centuries. And you notice something? We have not had a real revival in this country since 1904 because that was the year that America put the American Standard Version, which is Satan's masterpiece, on this continent. They haven't, as soon as England created the revised version in 1888, England lost its place as a world power. And today America is losing its place as a world power because they have turned their backs on the Word of God. Understand something. These scriptures are from the very same corrupt source that the Jehovah Witness Bible is from. And I, I can provide ample documentation of this to anybody who cares to discuss it. And we have a set of manuscripts today that are used that were translated by men like Westcott and Hort who deny all the fundamentals of the faith. How many of you realize that all the modern Bibles are based on textual criticism theories of Westcott and Hort, both of whom were apostates, both of whom were spiritualists and occultists, both of whom denied all the fundamentals of the faith? I mean, it, it's appalling what the church has allowed to happen here. Now you have the spirit of truth and the spirit of error, 1 John 4, 6. 
We know that Jesus is the living word. And we know that this is a living word. It says in Hebrews 4.12 that this is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. So this is a living book. It has life breathed in it. It, is, it says it is given by inspiration of God. That means it's alive because if God breathes on something, it is alive. Amen? Amen. And so therefore, this is as much the living word as is Jesus Christ. Now, the thing is, people will say, oh, you're dividing the church over minor issues. Well, God says this. He says in the 138th Psalm, verse 2, I have magnified my word above my name. Now, if you had a preacher in your pulpit who was up here going bleepity bleep bleep and bleep bleep the bleep 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 bleep, you'd throw the sucker out because he's taking the name of God in vain. And you've got preachers in thousands of pulpits in America that are up there quoting out of the dead Bible, I mean the living Bible, they're quoting out of the NIV and the NAS and all these other Bibles, and they're blaspheming God just as much as if they were up there going bleep 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 bleep. Because they are taking they are they are taking God's words and stealing them from you and you and the people in the pew all over America. This is an anti Bible, and an anti Christ needs an anti Bible. We are gradually moving in the direction of a New Age Bible. You know, the NIV is already very, very close to that. Right now, there are 400 Bible translations out there. Think of that. I mean, in English. Even Time Magazine, which is run by a bunch of secularist pinheads, is saying, do we really need 400 different translations of the Bible? I mean, has the English language changed that much in the last hundred years? Of course not. It's a big racket. Because, see, you can't make any money off of this book. There's no copyright on God's Word. There's a copyright from the Lachman Foundation on the American Standard Version. There's a copyright on the International Bible Society on the NIV. Can you copyright the Word of God? I dare say not. Therefore, those aren't the Word of God. And the guys that translated them say as much. They tell you there is no such thing as an inspired Bible today on the earth. Only the original autographs were inspired. Think about that. That's appalling. That means, you know, we're told in the Bible that the Word of God is nigh unto us. And they're telling us that no, it's not nigh unto us. It's, it's, you know, somewhere in some vaporous place far above anything else. That we can't find it anymore because it's disintegrated in the dust or God has taken it up to heaven. Now see, here's what's happened. This goes right back to the Illuminati. This goes right back to the Hegelian concept of synthesis, pardon me, thesis, antithesis, blah, antithesis and synthesis. <laughs> I feel like I'm going to lose my dentures here. Anyway, see, what you have here is a dualistic worldview being promoted. And what do I mean by that? There is no final authority if you can't put your hands on an infallible Bible. Because I can say, well, I prefer the King James. And someone else can say, well, I prefer the NIV. And someone else can say, well, I prefer the Living Bible. Who's going to straighten us out? What's the final authority? Obviously, it should be God. You see, here you got it. You set up two conflicting authorities. The Catholics did this with success for 1,500 years. They've got the Pope and Scriptures. And if the two contradict, the Pope wins. What we've got is two sets of Scriptures, or maybe three, or maybe four, or maybe a dozen, and who decides which one is best? We do. We judge God's Word. Isn't that big of us? God's Word judges us. Amen. We don't judge God's word. God's word judges us. See, this is the problem. Whose final authority, you know, like, like James Jasper Ray says, God wrote only one Bible. Why do we have 400 now? Something happened. I mean, it's like coat hangers in a closet. They propagate. And yet there's only, like it says in Deuteronomy 6.4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Now, whose final authority? 
Bible A, Bible B, or Bible C. Let the scholars decide, we say. And that what you've done is you've just created, you've, you've knocked the Pope off the throne. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. We've gotten rid of the Mormon prophet. We know he's not on the level. We've gotten rid of the Watchtower Society. We know they aren't true. But now instead we have this priesthood of scholars. I mean, I got, I got a letter the other day, for, or actually an email, a fax from James White. And he acted like, I'm a scholar in residence. How dare you question me? All I can say is I don't care if you've got a Ph.D. I don't care if you've got a Th.D. I don't care if you've got a D.D. If you are coming against the Word of God, you have the intelligence of a learning disabled fruit fly Amen. next to this book. Amen. Praise God. So here's the deal. Either we can let the scholars be our priesthood or... We can have one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one inerrant Bible. Remember, God is not the author of confusion. And yet if I were to go into most churches today and stand up in the pulpit and say, Beloved, let us read from the 23rd Psalm, what would we get? We'd get a cacophony. We'd get a babble of Bibles, pure and simple. And that is not something God created. Again, remember... The modern Bibles are the ones that attack the King James first. It's not the other way around. So if anybody is dividing churches, it is Satan. Remember, the root of the word diabolical means to divide, to cast asunder. That's the root of our modern word, devil. There is a proliferation of major and minor doctrinal errors in the Christian community today. Might this not be traced to the spread of Bibles which are not, in fact, Bibles? If you read from the true Bible, you are, in fact, producing and spreading, and if you will, transmitting the Holy Spirit into yourself, if you read it out loud, into your family. If, on the other hand, you read from a false Bible, what kind of spirit are you transmitting? Jesus said this, in Matthew 5.18, Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Amen. That's what Jesus said. I believe it. That settles it. Now here's what that means. A jot is the smallest letter in the Hebrew or Greek alphabet. It's a iota in Greek and a yod in Hebrew. It's like a little... <laughs> that's all it is. It's like a fly speck. And a tittle means like the crossing of a T. So he is saying that even the tiniest parts of the Bible are going to be preserved in purity. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words, plural, shall not pass away. Jesus said that in all three of the synoptic Gospels. Now some people say, and I heard somebody say this the other day, well the way you get the, way you get the true Bible is you take all of these Bibles and put them together. Doesn't that sound politically correct though? Let's all just sit down at a table and talk our differences out. You can't have a consensus Bible because if you put black and white together, all you get is gray. And the problem is, is that the one Bible contradicts the other. This Bible says 1 John 5, 7 is in there. That Bible says it isn't. How do you reconcile that? Do you put half of the verse in? And who would decide? Again, who is able to judge God's word? It comes down to a problem of authority. All the conspirators hate the idea of final authority. Why? Number one, it dethrones human intellect, i.e. the scholars, as a source of final authority. Number two, it makes a mock of the Tower of Babel one world government they're trying to produce. Number three, it destroys their, it destroys their idea of everyone has their own truth. Have you ever heard that? I mean, I just hate that when those... And yet that's what's going on. I mean, it's like we've got shopping mall Bibles. You know, I've had somebody say, well, you know, I read this Bible, and if I don't like what I see in that one, I go to that one. If I don't like what I see with that one, I go in that one, and I go to this one, and I go to that one. It's kind of like when I was a Catholic, as a kid, we used to go around and find a priest that was real lenient in our confession. If we knew that this one guy like had a real big deal about masturbation, we'd go to a different priest. Or if this guy had a big deal about cussing, we'd go to that priest. 
I mean, it's the same thing. The same exact problem. Therefore, if there's one final authority, then Satan can't pull any of this stuff because we have an absolute unchanging standard of measurement. It's funny how Bible marketeers today will avoid always calling this book the authorized version. They call it the King James Version. But its actual title is the authorized version. And yet, on the other hand, they're always comparing their Bibles to it. It's like this is still the final standard, even though they don't admit that it is. See, no other Bible has the authority which the authorized version has. Ecclesiastes 8.4 says, Where the word of a king is, there is power. No other Bible was authorized by a king. And oddly enough, God waited until there was a king on the throne of England who had a Jewish name, James to bring forth this book because the oracles are of the Jews. Okay. How do we know that this Bible is really the Word of God? Some people will say there are errors in this. I say, fine, prove it. I've been, I'm now on my 23rd time through the Bible and I've yet to find an error in it. Here's how I submit to you that we know that the King James Bible is really the Word of God by how much the devil hates it. <laughs> That's the number one way. Because he has been attacking this book since the get-go. This book is bathed in blood. People died for this book down through the centuries. Can you imagine anybody dying for the NIV? I mean, get real. I have correspondence in my files from missionaries where they are given cases of NIV Bibles and they send them back because it says they, they say it messes up the spirituality of their people. They know better. Over on, the, over on the mission field, these people are toe-to-toe -to -toe every day with the citadels of darkness. And they know you don't come up to, against Satan with a wet noodle when you can use the sword of the Spirit. It's that simple. By the fruit is it, has it borne. That's how you can tell. Has any other Bible produced the amount of sin-killing, devil-chasing, snot-slinging, tavern-closing revivals that this book has produced? Not a bit. I mean, they used to, you know, nowadays we talk about, oh, praise God, we have these mighty revivals. Well, revivals used to close down the taverns. They used to close down the whorehouses. They used to close down every citadel of sin in those communities because thousands of people would come to Christ. You don't see that anymore. When some of these old-time preachers preach out of the King James Bible, the, the ships that were at sea that were coming into port, people would fall out under the power of God and wake up saved when they were still miles out at sea. That's the anointing. That's the power of God. What we're seeing today is just a pallid reflection because it's being filtered through the dingy glass of these modern Bible versions. Think about this. Wesley used this Bible. Spurgeon used it. Bunyan used it. Jonathan Edwards used it. Finney used it. Moody, Moody used it. Billy Sunday used it. The early Billy Graham used it. Someone got to him. The early Jerry Falwell used it. Someone got to him. Also, by the power you get from preaching from it. I also believe it's the case because it exalts the name and deity of Jesus Christ and His blood more than any other version by a country mile. I ask you this. Who is served by having a Bible where all these places where the name of Jesus is glorified are removed? Who could possibly be behind that? Would the Holy Spirit be? Because the Holy Spirit is, says He comes to glorify Jesus Christ. So He would not be behind that. So it must be the other spirit. We also, you know, I, I think another reason is the fact that the King James Bible is most universally despised by liberal pablum puke theologians who deny the inerrancy of Scripture. I also believe that it's the real Word of God by the fact that when you simply open it on a table, demons begin to tremble. When you start reading out of this book, you begin to kick the slats out of Satan's kingdom. It is also, I believe, the true word of God by the fact that it was vehemently opposed by New Age matriarch Helena Petrovna Blavatsky. And she was the founder of the Theosophical Society. People say, well, why would it be this? Why would God pick this particular Bible, this particular time, this particular place? Well, people, for, for, little, little, <laughs> people forget 
that the Bible tells us that the Word of God has gone through seven periods of purification on the earth. Psalm 12, 6 says, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth purified seven times. This book has gone through seven languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, Old Syriac, Old Latin, German, and English. Also there is, and then, believe it or not, it's also gone through seven English translations before we finally got to the authorized version. There is also one church that kept the word of the Lord according to Revelations 3.8, the Philadelphia church. And a lot of Bible scholars feel that's the period that's covering from 1500 through 1900. It says in Revelations 3.8, I know thy works, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and thou hast kept my word, and not denied my name. That promise was not given to any other church. By some strange coincidence, our watches are set to English time. Does anybody complain about that? Greenwich Mean Time is the international standard for time. You wouldn't know where you are in the world today if it weren't for England because zero longitude is at Greenwich. Think about that. You wouldn't know what temperature you are if it weren't for England because we have British thermal units in our air conditioning. The bottom line in terms of fighting the devil against and his conspiracy, and I believe ultimately our weapons are not carnal. I'm not one of these people that says we've got to run out and buy automatic weapons and, you know, this kind of thing. Because it says in the word that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God. The pulling down of strongholds, the casting down of vain imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And I submit to you that these modern Bibles are high things that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. If the devil has a confusing mass of Bibles out there, then he is casting doubt on your authority, isn't he? For example, he removes, or at least casts doubt on, Mark 9, 16, 9 through 19 in all the modern Bibles. Did you know that? That's where it says, These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. They shall drink any deadly thing, and it will not hurt them. I know where I get the authority to cast out demons. It's from that verse and from others like it. But where do these New Age Bible altars get it? Modern Bibles tend to be more in the direction of New Age doctrine. For example, sodomites are missing from the NIV. Did you know that? That's because one of the translators on their committee was Virginia Mullencott, who's a lesbian goddess worshiper. Now, they'll deny that today, but we have letters in our file that document that, in fact, yes, she was on that translation committee. The unique deity of Jesus Christ is less emphasized. The Trinity is attacked. The ascension is cast in doubt. Do you really have the Word of God? Do you have the living words of God, or you just have a dead book? Because all these modern scholars that promote these new Bibles say, all this is is a dead book. Only the living, only the original autographs are inspired. But Jesus said in John 15, 7, If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what, I, what ye will and it shall be done unto you. Jesus was able to minister with authority because he had no doubt about where his authority came from. Some of these verses state that he cast out demons with his word. When you pray, preach, or teach out of that book, the Holy Spirit is present in a mighty and unprecedented way. If you're using another Bible as your warrant of authority, what if it's an Antichrist Bible? Now certainly, God will bless our work. And I'm not one of these people, you hear our position caricatured, they're saying you can't get saved out of an NIV Bible. Of course you can. You know, if God can use a donkey to preach, he can get someone saved out of an NIV. Amen? Amen. But that's not the point. Why give them cotton candy when you can give them the sincere milk of the word. Right. See, the problem with that is, is I believe baby Christians are a lot like baby ducks. They tend to follow the first big thing they see. And if you're running around with all these bizarre Bible versions, they're going to do the same thing. Okay. I believe right now God is certainly 
blessing the intentions, and I, I don't doubt for a minute the good intentions of many, many people that use these modern Bible versions. But you see, this is a lot like masonry. Most people are in the masons because someone they trust has told them it's okay. Most people use modern Bibles because someone they trust has told them it's okay. The irony of it is, is that the pastors that today are promoting the modern Bibles are doing so because their professors did so. And their professors are doing it because their professors did so. And nobody along the way has bothered to check this thing out. Nobody along the way has bothered to see where the real Word of God is. We are in the last days now, I believe, and the war is heating up fast. Preachers are dropping like flies. Christians are wandering around wrecked and wounded. The conspiracy is raging ever more powerful. And remember, in this war, we only have one real offensive weapon. The sword of the Spirit, the Holy Bible. I just would ask you, does yours shoot blanks? That's all I have for you tonight. Uh, I'm going to turn the time back over to Stan. And he has a few closing words. Now, as you hear all of this, uh, you may be thinking, wow, I have never seen such evil in all my life. Matter of fact, someone in the hall just said, I, I kind of feel dirty. Well, I think that's a, a good way to feel when you're hearing about all of Satan and all of his tricks. We ought to feel a little dirty because he is dirty, right? Amen? Okay, that brings us to another question. How do we get clean? Amen? How do we clean up? You see, there's two ways... Uh, that uh, there's two questions we have to ask ourselves when we see all of this. First question is, how do we get all of the sins washed off of our heart, washed off of our wedding garments? How do we get clean? Because we cannot stand before a holy God with sins on us. That's the first question. The second question is, how do we get clean enough so when all of the trouble we see written in Daniel and Revelation starts coming to pass, when it comes to pass, God is going to protect us and provide for us? Well, the first thing we have to realize is that we cannot earn our way to salvation. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For it is by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Okay, if getting our name written into the book of life so we get to go to heaven is a gift, and getting our sins washed off of our heart, all of that filthy stuff that we've all done, Getting that all washed away, if that's a gift, then how do we reach out and take that gift? We have to realize, that, first of all, that we're all sinners. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Believe it or not, I met someone one time that actually said to me, They have never sinned. But my Bible tells me we were sinners before we were born. It's like a virus in the bloodstream. And it got in Adam and Eve, and it's been passed down through the generations, folks. And we had it before we were born. We were born sinners. We cannot stand before a holy God. We never have been able to, not until the blood of Jesus washes those sins away. So that brings us to the next question. How do we get our sins washed off of our heart? How do we get all of those sins washed away? Romans 10, 9, and 10 gives us the answer. It's also the answer to how we get our name written in the book of life. And that is, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth into righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So what's that saying? It's saying that it's not enough to say it and not believe it. And it's not enough to believe it but not say it. We've got to say it. We've got to believe it. Also, Acts 2.38 says, Repent and be baptized. Everyone in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But we don't hear that much anymore. What is that R word? Repent. Well, we hear that, you know, you need to say a little prayer, but we don't hear much about repent. So what is repent? In my life, I sat down one day and I decided I was going to get right with God. And I said, Lord, I've made a mess of my life. I've lived it the way I want to, and it's a mess. But I'll tell you what. If you'll forgive my sins, if you'll wash me clean, if you'll give me another chance, from here on out, 
I'm yours. And I promise I'll learn your book. I'll learn your laws. I'll follow your laws. I'll do my very best to be a good servant from here on out. Now, that's repenting. And folks, that's what we need to see. Matter of fact, Christians, if you call yourself Christian and you cannot name a specific point in time to where you sat down and repented and asked God to forgive you your sins, then you should be concerned about your salvation. Now, Holy Spirit asks you to go out and knock on the hearts of those people in the audience that you would like to write their name in the book of life, that you'd like to clean all of the sins off of them, or those people that are watching the videotape that they would not put it off, that they would make the decision tonight in Jesus' name. Let's all bow our head. No one looking around. Yes, you may have prayed it, but let's still say it again. Let's say it all together, dear Heavenly Father. I admit I'm a sinner, and I confess with my mouth, and I believe in my heart that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, died on the cross, arose three days later, sits at the right hand of the Father, asking Him to forgive my sins, keep me holy, save me in the day of trouble. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, there's a lot of folks out there that tell you that's all you have to do. Now you're going to heaven. Now you can go and live like the devil. But that's not what my Bible tells me. My Bible tells me in Matthew 7, 21, that not everyone that cries, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven but those that doeth the will of the Father. Well, what is the will of the Father? He says, be ye holy, for I am holy. He says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. We should live without spot, without wrinkle, no sin, no spot. Now, it's not over in another way, because Matthew 10, 32 and 10, 33 says, Whosoever confesses me before men, him will also confess before my Father, which is in heaven. But whosoever, very serious, whosoever denies me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. That's pretty serious, folks. All he's saying is he wants people to have a little steel in their backbone for a change. Be willing to stand. I mean, he died for us. Can't we at least stand up and say Jesus is our Lord? And ask yourself this, Christians. If you have trouble standing up in a Christian meeting in front of Christians, and saying, Jesus is Lord of your life here. How will you do it when you're facing the barbed wire? How will you do it when you're facing mocking, teasing, or people from the world? Hmm? Probably a good place to start would be in front of Christians in a Christian meeting and then let it build from there. Amen? Now, I'm not going to embarrass anyone. I'm not going to ask you to come up front. But, so you can have Matthew 10, 32, and 3 fulfilled in your life. So you will have the opportunity to confess with your mouth in front of a group of people that Jesus is Lord. If you you prayed that prayer for the very first time, the first time you ever ask your sins to be forgiven, the first time you ask Jesus to be Lord, would you raise your hands, please?